Francis, the recording is going and it, the floor is yours. Francis, you're on mute. Good evening. Um, off mute now, I hope. Hi, good evening, everybody. This is uh, part one of the quality of life uh, committee meeting. This is the, the subcommittee on human services health and human services and we're going to have a brief presentation before we get into the other part of the meeting uh, uh we're going to have a brief presentation by pauline ferranta from the department of health and she's going to give us an update on what's going on with the services and resources for covid in new york city because as we all know it's constantly changing and every time you turn on your radio or open a newspaper you know there's vaccines and there's not and there's there's new variants and there's all kinds of things that have gotten us going crazy so i thought that it would be good for us to get a brief update so we can find out essentially, you know, what we're feeling and where we're at. And if we need more information, then we'll we'll have uh, another session. But right now, uh, I would like to introduce Pauline Ferrante from the Department of Health to help give us some idea in terms of what they what they're doing and what they're not doing. Okay, Pauline. Thanks, Francis. Um, so really, just quickly off the top of my head to share information, we have administered over a million doses in New York, which is great, um, but supply continues to be limited and um, the snow in the South is not really helping with the deliveries of doses. So we're kind of keeping an eye on that. Currently, second dose appointments are still up and running totally fine. There's no changes to that. Um, but there are some locations that maybe have to reschedule their first dose um, allocations um, due to the delay in shipment because of the weather. But we are, again, keeping a very close eye on everything. Um, good news also for CB1 is that a whole bunch of uh, pharmacies have come online to provide vaccine appointments for folks in the community. So that's great news. So I recommend everyone go on to vaccinefinder.com um, if you are in any of the eligible categories. And as of early Earlier this week, the governor had added certain underlying health conditions. It's a very long list. It's all on our website. So I encourage everyone to go onto our website to see if you fall into that category. And in an effort to make the vaccine available to, to everyone in those eligible categories and to sort of eliminate as many barriers as possible, um, the proof of eligibility for underlying health conditions um, will just be a form that is on our website that you attest that you have any of those underlying health conditions and that will make you eligible to receive the vaccine. But currently a lot of locations are prioritizing folks 65 and older only because we know they're the most vulnerable populations and they've had you know, a really difficult time accessing appointments just due to the nature of our scheduling, you know, system and, and the limited supply making appointments necessary. So we really are focusing on our senior population, making sure that they have equitable access. Um, other than that, today, new guidelines have come out about masks. So if you are interested and if you think that your cloth mask is not appropriately um, or sufficiently protecting you, there is guidance out saying that you can wear one of those light blue surgical masks and then a cloth covering, a face covering over that, and that will offer you more protection. And as long as your face covering is tight and fitted well around your nose and your mouth, you should be totally fine. Um, but there is that new guidance also on our website. Um, so yeah, those are sort of the brief, um, really up-to-date overviews. We continue to ask people to follow the core four, stay home if you're sick, um, maintain social distancing, wear your face covering, maybe double up if you are outside your home with people outside of your immediate household, and also wash your hands and use hand sanitizer are frequently so happy to answer any questions that people may have okay so we um lucian can we start with people from the committee uh first we need to see your hands have any questions for pauline uh, mitch 
Mitchell? Yes. Yes. I okay. Paul, well, first of all, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Everything you do, Pauline. I just have a, a, a curious. I actually read this week an interesting. I forget what newspaper it was an interesting op ed article about. Uh, like, let's say, you know, somebody's in the category over 65 or, or healthcare worker, whatever. And they were saying it might be more prudent in that situation to vaccinate the whole household, the whole family. But then I know that there's supply and, you know, like problems, but that, you know, it, like it's almost like a band aid approach, even though everybody's trying to do the best. And I'm just wondering if something like that has been considered where you're really attacking, like, you know, let's say there's two people over 65 or a healthcare worker in the house, but then there's, you know, three other people living in the apartment. And, you know, uh, it would be prudent to vaccinate. So, like, everybody in that household should be qualified for the vaccine at the same time the most eligible is. I was just wondering what your feelings are about that and if there's been any thought of, 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 of using that. Yeah, Mitch, that's a great point. And I think, you know, if if supply wasn't so limited, I think that would be something that would be able to be explored. Because um, we do know that living in New York City, especially in a lot of older apartments, you have multi-generational housing and a lot of people are vulnerable. And then, you know, people go to school, people go to work. And so they're more exposed, right? And so the risk level is higher. And I think that's a great point. And I, I really would love to say that we would be able to vaccinate households at a time but unfortunately because of the limited supply this phase you know eligibility and distribution needs to be implemented and so unfortunately that's not something we can consider at this point so, okay. but that's a great i mean that's that's a really valid point and considering how new york is very different than other parts of the country i wish that we would have that flexibility but we we just don't at this time okay thank you it just seemed that seemed to be if part of the, the medically most prudent thing to do, but I understand. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay, um, Bob Schnick. Bob, am I on? Yes, you are. Okay. So I I just wanted to ask the question, since since the since supplies are limited, it would be good if we had some kind of access to the information oh, yeah we can't hear you with your hand and your mouth i um from now. this end, from this end i kind of disappeared but um i was wondering since since the problem is with supply i was wondering if um if it's possible to give the public some idea of where those supplies are and how often how soon they're going to arrive and when there's a failure so we'd actually have the facts every day and so we'd have a sense of uh you know there's 10,000 coming next week and 40,000 the weekend after that or whatever it is but um the public really should have an idea of when sure they would love to know that too <laughs> i mean it would be yeah. terrific. And yeah i mean i think that's that sure they would come. love to have that information bob <laughs> But it's coming yeah. from like the federal and also yeah. the federal and they give it to the state and then the city has everybody has their hands in it. Right, Pauline? Correct. Yeah. Yes. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, it would be wonderful if we knew in advance um, sort of how many doses we were getting. I think the new administration has made it just a little bit easier just to get more advanced notice. But again, with the snow and shipping delays and things like that, it's just really hard to, to tell. Um, but on our website, I really want to plug the DOHMH um, website because we put as much information as we possibly can. So we have the amount of doses that have already been delivered, how many people have already been administered their first dose, how many people have been administered their second dose. We have demographic data, we have ethnicity yes. and, and all of these, you know, by zip code. So if you're interested in knowing how many people in your zip code have been vaccinated, that's on our website. So we try our very best to put as much information on our website as possible so that you as you as a citizen of New York have all this at your disposal. But you're right. I mean, I would love to be able to share sort of when our doses are coming in and how many, but we I just don't know if that's something we have the capability of doing. Well, yeah. it's something that, that, it feels like that would be really helpful to know because oh, absolutely. as as this has gone on, 
it started out with very limited numbers of people that were qualified. And then as people got as the as the, the government open agencies got more excited, they just kind of opened up the opened up the uh, the floodgates. Limit. And so yeah. as, more in, as they each time they added another limit, the difference between 75 year olds and 70 year olds and then 65 year old people each time the population gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger then you have you have you start with nursing homes and then you have have a central worker it's just it's just they should have really kept it to limited numbers of people till you got that done but now it's too late now well i mean that was hard too because then when you 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 have the issue of the restaurants trying to open you know then all of their employees and the People that you know work in the restaurants, they wanted the taxi drivers wanted it. Everybody, everybody that if if you are opening restaurants, then that changes the priorities. Yeah, and no, serious. Schools, you have to get the teachers. Yeah, and so on and so on and so on and so it's just we should have been more disciplined about how we did this. And well, if you're kind of doing schools, you just send people out to the schools and get them. If you're doing healthcare workers, you can do that at the hospitals and so on. Well, and so they've on. gotten much better since they, I mean, you know, there's little improvement. The only thing is we need the vaccines now. That's, that's our biggest hurdle. Okay. I just have a, a personal question here. I actually, at one point, uh, had a, had with Mount Sinai, a lucky March 9th, and then they just cancel, canceled it outright. And so. I am over 70 and also I have a significant health condition that qualifies me, but you said in your commentary on this that it's trying to prioritize prioritize people who are older and I suppose I count for that and I have 6 or 7 hours in 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 rolling the dice with over the internet trying to get something to work for me again and it's hard. Is there any way I could take advantage of of the age priority? Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. So I think what the city did based on a lot of the feedback that we've been getting from the communities, we stream streamlined the, the vaccine finder website as well. Um, so now it shows at a city site or an H and H facility, whether or not first dose appointments are available. So you're not spending all of your time filling information only to find out that there are no um, available doses. But I think in order to take advantage of sort of your, you know, your age, when, when was um, I, I, I think, I, yeah, I, I think on that two days ago yeah i mean I, even, and, and first doses are not available right now uh Bob. Right. they're yeah. not they're, they're off the they're only doing in doses right now right in, yeah, right. So the first doses are extremely limited, and I don't know whether or not the city sites are accepting first dose appointments right now. Um, so that will change, though, as we get our supply. And so that's something to keep in mind is that when we take inventory and are able to really identify how many doses a site has on hand, that's when we're able to open up the appointments because we don't want people to get canceled. So, um, so we're only allowed to open up appointments as the doses come in. Um, but I think in terms of, you know, maybe the federal pharmacy program might be helpful to you based on your age, because I believe I, the pharmacies I, I, are... I, I did that and I, okay. I visited all those websites of, of CVS and Dwayne Reed and and Walgreens and so oh, on and so on. So, and it didn't get very far. But my question is, since since the city can program things, why doesn't it just take the names of, of people that want that that need the shot, you just register your name in that, say, give the area where you want to want to get your shot and then just have the city send that, you know, when there's a match, then it can send the people um, how that matches and then you can follow up and go to that site. Yeah, that's a great idea. Well, I just I don't we'll know whether or not. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's a fantastic idea. I think it's been discussed. I just don't know whether or not we have that technological capability exactly. to do so. Um, you know, again, a big shout out to like our you our do it folks who who've revamped the website. They've worked very hard on that. Um, it's just right. I don't know whether or not we have that capability to sort of take on a wait list and then match people to sites. I just okay. honestly I don't think we have that capacity. Okay, uh, we need to move on because we have a couple more hands and we know we need to get to the rest of this meeting. 
Einstein. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I've got a, a selfish question and an un unselfish. Um, the selfish one is I'm just turned 64. I have an underlying condition. Now there's, there, I know that, that Dwayne Reed, Walgreens, there's one right in my building, but I was told they're only giving uh, vaccines to those 65 or older. Is that ever going to change in the future? I mean, I because I'm willing to wait. You know, I don't want to have to go like to to like Jones Beach or someplace. Sure. Or yeah, I mean, of course, as as supply becomes more available, as the federal government is ramping up the production of supply, yes, then pharmacies will be able to sort of open up um, their availability and their eligibility um, criteria. So again, I think what the issue is in New York City specifically is that we were seeing seniors having a really difficult time accessing appointments just due to the nature of the website being really difficult to navigate and the lack of supply and so prioritizing them is sort of the main um, goal but you're right you know folks with underlying health conditions are equally as important and so we just need to make sure that as supply comes in we make our sites readily available for everyone who needs a vaccine to be able to get one. And the second question is, is, is there anything the city can do for their home, people who are homebound who just can't even maybe even go down, downstairs to Dwayne Reed or may not have access to the Internet to be able to schedule the appointments, language, physical, you know, there are people who cannot leave their apartments. How are they going to, to get vaccines? Yeah, and this is a great point. And I think, unfortunately, in this particular scenario, it was sort of like the, the perfect storm of like worst case scenarios, right? It's the, the vaccine itself is just completely incapable of being traveled, like taken from point A to point B. It needs to be stored in an extremely cold temperature. It needs to be monitored as it's thawing. There's just no way at this time that we can issue or bring the vaccination to homebound seniors. However, the mayor has like discussed the possibility um, yeah. with the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. They've applied for the emergency use authorization and they are hoping that this vaccine would be the one that we can actually bring to homebound, like truly homebound seniors who cannot leave their homes. Because number one, it's a one dose vaccine. And number two, it doesn't have that same really cold storage requirement. And so it's a much more stable vaccine to be able to travel around. So we'll learn more as, um, you know, as we hear more about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. But I think, you know, with the Moderna and the Pfizer, they're just not capable of, you know, bringing it to, to folks, unfortunately. Okay. Um, we have Pat, Mariama, and Justine, and then we have to move on. Pat? Hi. So, um, Pauline, there's a couple of things. First of all, it's extremely difficult to get back-to-back -back appointments. So, if two people need to get an appointment, it is ridiculously hard to do. companion appointment you're talking about. I'm sorry? Uh, it, they're looking at a companion yeah. appointment. That's like I'm taking at. care of my 92-year-old yes. mom. I had to make an appointment in Manhattan and make an appointment for her in Queens. I couldn't get two back to back. So right. I just want everyone, Pauline, to be aware of that. If they are not, that it's extremely difficult because caregivers need to make appointments for right. two people and, and spouses. The second thing is the news told us that, that the president had secured 200 million doses. Does that mean 100 million first doses and 100 million second? What, what does that mean, 200 million doses? So your first, your second question first, I'm not 100% sure. So I will find out and I will send Lucian an email when I get clarity on the 200 million and what that means. Um, yeah. And then with regards to the two appointments at once, we think that maybe calling um, the hotline might be the best way to go because, oh no, sorry, Pat. I'm sorry. No, yeah, but they I were mean, discussing that at, at the task force because um, and and um, Gail Brewer sent this letter to the mayor and she was outlining a lot of specific things and the it was point number four. I remember specifically that she's requesting that because that's an issue that has been brought up at those task force meetings. So that she's on it. She understands that. But I Pauline, just to know these. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think that's really important. We have heard this as well. Yeah. I think, 
Yeah, I mean, especially with people who are, you know, elderly, have a caregiver who or, you know, just more comfortable traveling with their spouse or their their companion. Yeah, absolutely. Totally understand that point. Yeah, and then the last thing is that, that I, I know someone who went to Harlem Hospital to get and then to get the first uh, dose. And they were told that if they didn't have insurance, they would have to pay a $42 administra administration fee. And I thought that it was free. So if you don't have insurance, I thought it was free. Yeah, just, no, so it, sh it should be free, um, but you know, they are able to charge, uh, so certain locations are able to charge an administration fee or a co consultation right. fee or doctor's office fee. That but is they, different than like the actual charging for the vaccine. So okay. I actually did didn't know? hear that H&H &H hospitals were doing that. I was well, under the impression the that all. And so I think that that needs to be put out there because when yeah. people, she, she arrived there not knowing that she Yeah, no, I, and I don't think that that's supposed yeah. to happen at a city-run hospital. Well, you yeah. might want to look into that. Yeah, Ooh, I think that's re a really good flag, yeah. Pat. Um, I, I will circle back with the H&H &H folks. Obviously, I don't know what they're, what, how they're operating. So I will, I will definitely circle back with them just to see sort of what happened in that case. Great, thank you. Okay, Mariama? Yeah, just real quick. Um, I don't know if they still have it, but I know people that last week and this week were able to get same day appointments at Rite Aid on at seven Madison Street um, behind one police plaza. Also, Costco on Third Avenue in Brooklyn. They were doing same day, um, but you need a, a membership at Costco to get that one. Right aids are done. I went. I it took me hours, and I got one at that at that spot. Did you? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I'm glad you got one. Yeah, okay. but but then, but then you did they set you up for the second one? The I other people I know have second have second I, appointments too in March. Yeah, I don't know. I I assume which you should never do, but I assume no, when I wait, right. they're supposed to tell you when you're supposed. You know the amount. No, 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 then you need to go check back with them because you're supposed to have a certain because there's a certain amount of time and you're supposed to get it at the same same time from the same okay. location. I made two appointments with Rite Aid, one in Queens for my mom and one for me at 7 Madison and neither neither told us about a second. So when you go to your first dose appointment, they will be able to schedule your second dose. So don't yeah. leave Rite Aid without having your second dose appointment yeah. in your hands. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's how they're doing it. Also, I was trying to find the article while I was waiting to be called. There's a, uh, a young Asian engineer that got really, really frustrated that his mother could not get an appointment. Or he couldn't find an appointment for his mother. And he created an app that's like a vaccine locator. And it tells you <laughs> where the available vaccine is. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, I mean, I, you know, my parents had a really difficult time navigating it as well. And unfortunately, I have no degree in, in software engineering. So, <laughs> unfortunately, I couldn't help them. Um, but yeah, so there are some sites out there where people have taken it upon themselves to create sort of a, um, a, a vaccine finder of places that have available vaccines. And it's pretty, you know, up, it's so th what they're doing is they're refreshing for you. So essentially you visit their website and you'll see immediately sort of what sites have availability and they're on the back end constantly refreshing so that they can put that information out there for you. Um, so you're not the one pressing the refresh button. Yeah, I don't know the off the top of my head what that website name is. I forgot. Mm -hmm. um, but if I find out, I will send that solution as well. Justine and then Mitchell real quick because we're already past the halfway mark and I don't want Pat killing me. There you just go. Sorry, right. can I just say it's yep. called TurboVax. It's called TurboVax, like TurboTax, but with a V. Oh, thanks. Oh, thanks, Rosa. Okay. Justine? My, my question is more of a question or a comment or suggestion, actually, because um, with the drugstore um, ability to, to go to the drugstores to get the, get the vaccines, once that opened up, it was easy enough for me to get a, a, a vaccine from a appointment for my mom. I actually got it the same day it opened up for her. She's 97 years old. I got it at Rite Aid in Brookfield, so in Battery Park City. Since then, I guess they're only all drugstores are only taking 65 and 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 over. 
Um, one thing I would suggest that would kind of address, I think what Diane was saying and um, maybe what, what um, Bob was saying too. Why is it that with the um, drugstore vaccination program and the way that's set up, once you put in your zip code, it should direct you to just a specific number of drugstores and why if there's a lot of appointments available, but you're not 65 or whatever, because you now you've got the comorbidities or whatever else, why is it being blocked? Why, is, well, I mean, I know you're trying to get to the elderly people. I get that they're not either they're done or they're, or they're not knowing how to work this. And they're not taking advantage. Why can't people go in person if they can go to their drugstore and get there, sign up on a wait list, have the drugstore call them? I mean, I get you're not going to walk in the door and say, I'm going to stand here for five hours and wait for a vaccine. Right. But yeah, I mean, I don't know the I don't know the specific details um, to the federal vaccine. Um, pharmacy vaccination program um, and whether or not there were specific guidelines and how they were supposed to. I think there was. Yeah, so I mean, I can look that up and I will be, I will issue. share that with Lucian. That would that's be great. So no, I mean, I, I think that I, that they're there, they exist and yeah, they're, that's not, a, it's a great they're not helpful in what they're doing is what I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. With okay. local so drugstores, mm-hmm. especially in New York City and, and any place where you could walk to it, You've got a finite number of people who are going to go to that drugstore. How about opening up that drugstore with the number of, of vaccinations that you could possibly get? You know, and obviously if they only get, you know, 100 a day, well, that's all you can get. But open it up to the people who are in the neighborhood only, and then you get that neighborhood finished. Yeah. See, again, like I was saying, in terms of everybody's got their hand, we got the city, the state, and the federal government. And you don't know. Who's giving out? That's a federal program. And then the city, I went to the city program at 125 Word Street. That's a 24 hour location. But that's insane. Who, who wants to go 24 hours a day? Nope. I, mean, I guess people do, but no, my first appointment was at 2 15 in the morning. Oh once, my God. I was, once I was logged into the system, I went back in and changed my appointment because somebody else, you know, because it's, uh, somebody else dropped out and I got a later appointment. But my point is, is that since it's a 24 hour site, they have, they have constantly have p- appointments turning over. And who's people that? That's are... not the city. I'm Cause sorry. I've been trying to make an appointment for math. I can't tell you how long. One, that's Maybe. the city. Move along. City. Department of Health. Okay. Mitchell real quick. And then we got to go. Real quick, I just wanted to give Bob and Cora a tip. Uh, it may be Bob, uh, Charles B. Wang Clinic in Chinatown. They have two sites. I know your wife is, is uh, knows that clinic. It's a great clinic in Chinatown off Canal. Call them up and get on their wait list. Uh, they they were, were giving the, the shots. And yeah, uh, I, uh, I would I would recommend uh, you trying to, that would be another thing that's maybe not advertised, but uh, I would call Charles B. No, Wayne it's Clinic. on the vaccine finder, because that's one of the, the sites that was listed oh. on the vaccine finder, yeah. Okay, fine then, but just, you know, Cora knows that place, because Margaret Chin is, is uh, you know, supports that place. So I would call that place up. I know the place well too, so I'll, oh, I'll go out to the lobby. Great. Okay. Orlean, do you have any uh, <laughs> closing <laughs> closing tips for us? Just thank you so much for having me. Happy to come back whenever you need me to. So just let me know, and I'll I'm happy to come back. Okay, thank you All very right. much. Good. Any Bye. other questions? have a good night, everyone. Any you other questions? Just um. send them into uh, Lucian or um, Pat, and we'll make sure that we have a. A follow up appointment, which I'm sure will be necessary. Yeah, Francis, okay. you may want to, and Pauline, you may want to do this again next month because obviously everybody's got lots of questions and things change constantly. Sounds uh, good. Okay, we can do well, it at the thanks. beginning of next month's meeting. We'll we'll let people know. We'll after we discuss it. Okay, thank you very bye. much. Okay, bye. <laughs> so good evening, everyone. I'm Pat Moore, chair of the Quality of Life, and Mariama James is co-chair. Mariama is there. And we're going to move along uh, kind of quickly. Tonight, we have the new captain of First Precinct here. Captain Smith, are you available? Good evening, everyone. How are you? Welcome. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. And welcome to Community Board One. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, I want to start off by just uh, offering my condolences for uh, Tony Mataro. Um, I heard nothing but great things about him. 
uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to meet him, but uh, moving forward, I do want to continue the relationships that he was instrumental in uh, help building with us in the community. So thank you. Thank you. So we, I, you know, I, this was a, this, it started out by just asking you to come to say hello and introduce yourself. But there have been some incidents in the community recently, and I thought you might be able to fill us in on what's going on. So we've had a couple of shootings that we've heard about, okay. and we um, we've had. I wanted to also ask you about what's going on with the police and the interaction with the homeless. Okay. And then I know the subway is not your actual, you know, area, but if you could give us some insight into what's going on with the subway and the uptick in crime. And then the last thing is, can you of the community so that tell about what it is and uh you know and and how they can participate okay um i'll start off with the homeless conditions that's uh that's a, that's a large problem throughout the city um you know just to just to reinforce and explain our role in the nyvd is to work with agency partners and we, what we do is we preserve the peace and assist in gaining voluntary compliance from these individuals hoping that they will accept services and uh, we also facilitate cleanups. When there when there's no criminality occurring, we make referrals to the Department of Homeless Services, sanitation and EMS if medical services are needed. In addition to that, we have uh, code response teams, which is made up of specially trained police officers along with clinicians who will who will patrol and offer help and facilitate services to those who have fallen away from the care that they need. Um, recently, uh, we established a, a new position, uh, the chief of interagency operations, which is working. I'm sorry, with help with that is again. I'm sorry, we have a new position. It's the chief of interagency operations, and they be, they'll be working under the deputy commissioner for community partnerships. And what they will be doing is they'll be coordinating with these other city agencies and non-governmental organizations to transition certain functions to those agencies where that is their core mission. You know, and uh, we also we encourage the community to reach out to our neighborhood coordination offices you know, bring certain uh, certain conditions to our attention. You know, recently, uh, NCO sector Adam, they, uh, they, they were instrumental in facilitating a successful removal of trailers with our partner agencies under the FDR over at South Street area, which were being used as homeless encampments. Um, we have 4 locations hotels that are being used as homeless shelters. Of those four locations, we only have 16 911 calls in the last 28 days. We don't have any 311 calls, and we have one complaint report for a grand larceny, which was uh, committed by a, an employee of the shelter who took a phone from one of the tenants. Uh -huh. um, and um, we have three arrests of persons associated with the hotel. That one employee over on Water Street at the Hilton, and then uh, let me just get this break. We had a, a burglary in Queens of uh, packages. And, uh, you know, he lived over at 6 Water Street to Hilton. And there was also a criminal possession of a controlled substance arrest in the, in Brooklyn in the A3 precinct. And that perpetrator also lived at, uh, I'm sorry, 6 Water Street. So of those locations, you know, nothing's really jumping out as far as any attention we need. Uh, but we do pay uh, special attention to uh, the Hilton location because of the fact that the majority of any activity in this precinct is coming from that location. Um, as you said, there were some shootings. We had a shooting at the Artisan Hotel, 24 John Street. On uh, February 7th, there was a, a music video being filmed and uh, there was a couple of uh, rival groups out in front of the location. Um, two sets of uh, perpetrators did exchange gunfire between each other. No one was hurt, no one was struck. And uh, you know, from that incident, we were able to make four arrests and recover three firearms. Wow. Subsequently, the following day, while doing a, conducting an investigation at that same hotel, our NCO sector Adam uh, was able to uh, able to recover another firearm from a car parked outside from perpetrators exiting the hotel, which led us to uh, consult with hotel management, which we were alerted to the fact that they had three or four rooms on the same floor together, and through our cooperation with that hotel, we were able to arrest another. Five individuals and recover another four firearms from that location. Um, that's on our radar, you know. But prior to that incident, we were working with the, the hotel owner, Sal Loria, who, uh, you know, was uh, 
we, we noticed the trend in and around that area. We, uh, we made a, we made contact with the owners and management and they were reaching out to our NCOs. And, uh, you know, since that incident, um, Mr. Laurier, he did, he did compile a bunch of security measures that he's taken now to curb that violence at that location. Okay. Um, for instance, uh, at 11 p.m. every night to 6 a.m., they lock the doors now, which they didn't do before, and they only allow hotel guests with valid room keys. You know, um, they added additional security cameras to, uh, to up it to about 100 security cameras. They also, what they were doing, weren't doing prior that night, they weren't uh, doing the elevator lockouts, where you were able to go on any floor of the hotel without using a room key. Now they're using that. Um, they have security now doing checks over, overnight in the building, they're checking the floors, they're patrolling uh, the hallways, the staircases, you know. Um, the new protocol is checking into a room. They only give one room key out now, so they can't pass it from uh, friend to friend. And, um, you know, they're limiting the, the amount of guests to each room now. Any one bedroom room is only allowed two guests, and any two bedroom room is only allowed four guests. You know, um, these, these youths have been attracted to these hotels in that area due to, um, the relaxed security protocols, the, the, the low rates that they wouldn't normally have access to, and uh, just uh, COVID in general, just, uh, you know, the, the conditions out there in the streets. So, you know, we are working with them. We are working with our hotel and uh, hospitality alliance, and we're, we're putting out tips as far as security measures, and we're increasing our collaboration with those properties. Thank you. You're welcome. I hope there wasn't too much, you know. <laughs> we, have, we have a recording. We can go back and oh, look. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. And um, I guess you, you mentioned transit. You know, we're, we're working closely with Transit District 2 and Captain Tony Brown over at that location. We're doing joint operations, just increased uh, patrols surrounding our hot spots. Um, daily, we have resources from every precinct in Manhattan South. You know, we have those to supplement our patrol coverage. And we also have our Blair units, which is a specialized units uh, in unmarked cars coming from the patrol bureau that, you know, that uh, patrol certain areas in these nondescript vehicles in order to enhance our, our observation capabilities and determinants. Great. So then the last thing was, would you just make everyone, uh, there are many people who don't know about the community council. Okay, um, community council is, uh, we hold a monthly meeting on the last Thursday of the month. Our next meeting is February 25th at 6 p.m. It's gonna be a Zoom meeting. Um, I can give you the number to my community affairs office. If you wanna get on the list, we'll, we'll blast out the link. Their number is 212-334-0640. And, uh, you know, we'll take your name and we'll get your contact information. I'll send you an email with the link. And uh, we always encourage the, the use of social media, our Twitter and Facebook accounts. You know, we like to post a lot of pertinent information on, on those uh, venues. And we, we, we encourage the, the collaboration with our neighborhood coordination officers. You know, we have sectors Adam and sector boards with affect community board one. You can find their information along with their phone numbers on the, the nypd.gov page and, and click on the first recent links. So my, my first Captain, question is, what, uh, oh, sorry, Pat, Captain, could you repeat the phone number? I'm going to send it out in the chat. Sure. All right, 718, I'm sorry, excuse me, 212-334-0640. That's uh, First Precinct Community Affairs. Thank you. And, and who is the officer? Is it, will anyone pick up or is there a specific uh, officer? Uh, yeah, yeah. Right, that's what I thought. Thank you. <laughs> and then, so people just call and they'll speak to Officer Nelson and he will take their numbers and put them on the list to get in. Well, I guess you'll take their, um, their email. Contact address. information, their email addresses, absolutely. And, uh, right. Hopefully when the COVID restrictions lift, we can all meet back here at the precinct like they did in the past. I look forward to meeting every one of you in person. Great. And then the other question is just yeah. tell people what happens at the community council meeting. Oh, well, we talk about the, the crime trends, you know, we give an overview of What's occurring in the neighborhood? We take questions. We, you know, we work together. We, we collaborate in order to address any concerns you have. Uh, you get to meet me. I'll give you my number. You have a direct link to me if anything. And uh, you know, it's just what we do. We want to work with the community. So anyone who has not been to one of these meetings, you might be interested in attending. 
And uh, I think if we'll take questions, if there are some questions. And I don't know that. Who has their hand up? Jet Justine? I do. I'd like to wait a little bit. I want to hear what the um, the bunch of people in the um, attendee list having questions. I'd wait till after that, but I also see Before Mitch. That, has hand. Let's let Mitch. Mitch, you have a question. Yeah. Yes, Captain Smith, <clears throat> I'm on the trains all the time because, uh, you know, just that's that's like because I have to. And I was just wondering, I know that's not your your area, but most of the time when I see the cops underground and even sometimes up by the, the, the front of the station, like right by the stairs, there'll be there could be three or four all in a group. And, I, you know, I just instead of maybe I know that you don't want to have one by themselves. So, but instead of having like two, and then maybe two, like like in a station like say Chamber Street or Forty Second Street, or where there's like like a thousand feet of of entrances, I'm just wondering, is that just kind of like they're kind of all like ad, you know, like uh, ad libbing and and kind of just hanging out like on their own, or is there a policy because it seems to be not the best use of uh, of assignments for like. You know, more than two to be like hanging out in the same area when there's such a large station. I, I, I understand how it looks outside looking in. Honestly, I can't answer that question. I don't okay. know transit protocols and I've never worked in transit, so I wouldn't want to say anything, but you know, I just encourage you to um, come to our community council Zoom meeting next week. Captain uh, Captain Brown will have representatives from transit. You know, that may be a question better suited for them directly. Okay. So, uh, you know, it's not that I don't want to answer. I just I understand. Every, we've all seen we've all seen it, and it, it's for just for the more safety of everybody. Because you know, uh, it, and I, I think it would be a uh, you know anyway. Thank I you. Understand. I understand. What you're and so, Lucian, I can't see. Wait, 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 wait. I see a bunch of hands. It's Lindsay and Lisa and Matthew and Roseanne and Taylor. So shall we just take it in order? So Lindsay, Lisa, Matthew, Roseanne, and Taylor. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, this is Lindsay. Um, I have a statement I'd like to read. Uh, New York communities must redefine public safety and protect those targeted by surveillance, policing, and punishment. Poor people and people of color disproportionately face the police's fear-inducing and discretionary practices. I'm urging the Manhattan Community Board 1 to submit a statement opposing police brutality and sexual harassment and the racist nature of this institution and committing Manhattan Community Board 1 to keeping its people safe. From the murder of George Floyd to the storming of the Capitol, myriad incidences reveal how law enforcement remains prejudiced and unfettered. As New York City responded to the structural racism of law enforcement, police officers met some of these demonstrations with excessive and violent tactics. The New York City Department of Investigation report assesses NYPD's systematic response to protests from May through June. Hereafter, Floyd protests, the findings on NYPD's strategies, training, and policy community relations include that the NYPD won lacked a clearly defined strategy tailored to such protests, two, heightened, heightened tensions with crowd control tactics and excessive enforcement, three, deployed insufficiently trained officers, and four, lacked a centralized community affairs strategy. Okay. Will you consider, I just have one, one last sentence. Will you okay. consider looking at legisla legisla legislation like ending qualified immunity, the Breathe Act, and Justice for Breonna Taylor Act that put forth alternatives and solutions. Well, and, uh, who are you addressing that to? Captain? Is that yes. who you address? I mean, I don't want to. Sorry, what was your question? Uh, the question after my statement was Will you consider looking at legislation like ending qualified immunity? The Breathe Act and Justice for Breonna Taylor Act that put forth alternatives and solutions. NYPD is always looking to collaborate with our community. And the community board will be taking up some of this in a reso. So, Lindsay, um, you might want to check back in and see what we're up to. Okay. okay. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you. So because we have limited time, the rest of the speakers, would you please limit your questions or your statements to a minute? So shouldn't you have a timer? Sure. So who's next? It's, uh, it is uh, Lisa Dickinson. Hi, thank you. Um, I would just like to, uh, I don't have a screen here. I would just like to thank the captain, thank the police force, and as a longtime resident and worker in New York to um, express that I have never seen better policing anywhere. And, um, and I'm very saddened by the situation downtown now as a result of COVID and such. Um, I'm representing 65 Nassau right now, which is right next door to the arts. And we're very grateful for the work that you've done. Um, there was some frustration prior to it and a sense that the owner of the artsen was sort of complicit, I won't say complicit, but not enthusiastically doing anything to prevent the blatant drug dealing that was going on out there. So, you know, we intend to remain vigilant um, and we're hoping that that will go on. Uh, I know you're looking for a question. The, um, the biggest fear we have right now are around the homeless and the stabbings. Um, you know, several of my neighbors have noted that the individual that was just arrested was a long time, you know, if I die, hang her out. Um, and, I, and I guess my fear is with the new approach to dealing with the homeless, we don't really know who the intractable homeless are that, you know, just don't want shelter and want to live on the street and who the ones are that will become violent. And I know there have been, um, I've heard rumors of other stabbings downtown in the FIDI area. I mean, what what can we do? What can we do to help support you to, um, you know, to help feel safer and to see to the safety? And you know, clearly other homeless people are the victims when this happens. And it's it's quite disturbing. What can we do as a community to help you and give you support to um, to help rectify that? Well, the, the number one way you can help us is communicate with us. You know, we need to know what's going on. We don't see everything that you may see, and we need you to work with us. And um, we, 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 we would like your suggestions and, you know, how do you think we can uh, resolve these issues together? It's not just an NYPD solution, it's a community solution. So, you know, we are looking to collaborate with the community and, and, and take your suggestions and see what we can do to resolve this issue. Not only do you live in this community, we work in this community. This is also our community as well. So we're looking to do anything that we can do to strengthen the relationships and improve the quality of life in this area. Can I just ask for clarity from that, that last Wait, speaker? Before, I'm sorry, uh, before. So, Lisa, just make sure you get your name, call, and get, you know, attend, if you can, the council meeting, okay? Community council meeting. I'm sorry, Mariana. Can I, I just wanted her to clarify what hotel she was speaking of. I thought she said she was next door to the artisan, but then she started talking about homeless. That hotel is not one of the DHS homeless hotels, right. so I'm confused. Just trying to get clarity. Yeah, 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 I was talking about the arts, and that's correctly. It's not a homeless hotel. I'm aware of that. So that was one issue. Um, but I, we are concerned uh, generally about the homeless and the homeless uh, becoming violent and that whole that whole idea. Um, to the captain, we would be happy to entertain the idea of additional surveillance on our building if that would be helpful to you. So, I mean, in terms of communicating, we are we are right on that corner. Um, so that's certainly that's something I, I don't want to use everybody's time here, but we can certainly follow up at the, uh, the next meeting. Like I said, we, know, we appreciate any help we can get and you have the number for my community affair office. I ask that you call us at your convenience and uh, let's, let's, let's arrange a conversation and we can talk further about this offline. Right. Okay, great. Everyone, Thank this you. Is Lucian, I'm the district manager. I just want to uh, say that if you are witnessing a crime in progress or any kind of emergency or uh, life or safety situation, please call 911. Anything else, something that's off, but you, the city needs to respond to it, um, please call 311 or use your phone and the internet for 311 complaints. But if you if you witness a crime, do not hesitate to call 911, no matter what the severity level is, let the operator decide uh, who, who to dispatch to the crime. All right. Um, okay. I think it's Matthew, sign Matthew. Can you hear me? Yes. yes sir. Okay, great. 
Uh, this is actually, uh, first of all, welcome to Captain Smith, but this is a question more for community board members. Recalling discussions over the last nine months or so about issues of race generally and the question of excessive force by law enforcement in particular, there was some skepticism among board members about whether those issues were specific to Lower Manhattan. In the months since, the state attorney general, the office of the inspector general, and the mayor have all weighed in raising concerns about this use of force. And much of that use of force, many of those incidents took place in Lower Manhattan within the confines of Community District 1. In view of these developments, along with incidents like the Confederate flag being tied to the front door of the Museum of Jewish Heritage, is there support among the CB1 members present tonight for a task force or a committee that will focus on social justice, racism, and white supremacy? Matthew, I think that we need to talk about that separately. So can we, um, I see Justine has her hand up, Justine. I'm just supporting and saying, yes, I agree with him, but I'll wait my turn. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think this is not something like you said. It's more for the community board. So, can we come back around to that and 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 get the questions for uh, Captain Smith taken care of first? Of course, that's a decision for you. Um, I I think if such a thing were an initiative were to take place, it would start at the committee level, and this committee is probably the natural venue for that. So, realistically, it will either happen or not happen beginning here. But thank you for uh, taking yeah. the time. We'll come back to it. Okay. Let's see who's next. Uh, Roseanne, hi. Can you hear me? Yep, yes. we can. Yeah. Hear me? We can hear you, Roseanne. Okay. So, um, first of all, I'd like to thank Captain Smith for coming to this meeting. A resident here in Battery Park City, and I have a little app on my phone called the Citizen. So I have been watching the uptick in local crime, a lot of violent crime in our neighborhood and surrounding our neighborhood. And so we completely appreciate um, the kinds of efforts that the police force are making on our behalf to make our community safer. And one of the reasons that I wanted to speak today is talk about community safety um, and talk about community. Our community has witnessed um, over the course of the last, say, six months, a lot of what we call, well, a lot of police brutality. And it seems to be um, brutality that is focused on race. Your, your mental so illness, Roseanne, we the question? Then, the, um, I, I've written something, but I'm not going to read it because it's just going to be too redundant. Mm -hmm. so I'm just gonna, uh, yeah. Do you have a question? So, the DOI report really assessed the kinds of brutality that we actually witnessed, and assessed it, and talked about it, and really condemned it, as we all do. And I'm sure you do, uh, Captain Smith. But in any case, this... Um, Gives us pause and makes us think, what can we do as a community working with you? What can we do to set together some kind of a commission, racial equity, racial um, justice, have some transparency in terms of anti racist training that we would love to see happen in the NYPD? It should be happening everywhere, definitely for people who have. Guns and Rosanna lots over. and lots would and lots you, of power. It would be nice if we knew that there was anti-racist training happening. We believe that all racist behavior should be uprooted. We believe that officers who have been um, Rosanna, it's over seen a minute. doing things that are brutal, racist kinds of behaviors. Rosanna. I don't want to have to cut off your mic, but can you, if you have a question, can you ask the question? If not, then can you take this? I can't to... hear you. Uh oh, you can't hear me. Are you speaking to me? I'm, I'm still talking. I guess I'm over did my. Oh, yeah, you're, you're well over your minute. You're like 2 minutes. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry. No, I was going to say, come to the council meeting, the police council meeting. 
can you hear me? No. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Taylor. Hi, Taylor. Hi, good evening. Thank you. Um, I'm a resident of, of CB1 and have been my whole life. Uh, CB1 is and has historically been home to protest movements, which makes us all the more accountable and responsible for the treatment of protesters. While New Yorkers demanded attention and change to issues of police brutality and gender-based violence and racism and systemic racism, their constitutionally protected rights um, were violated violently um, by those very police. So my question is to the captain. Um, and in, so the New York City Department of Investigation states, stated, some police officers engaged in actions that were at minimum unprofessional and at worst unjustified excessive force or abuse of authority. So how can our precinct and our community board ensure that its constituents may live without fear to assemble in peace? Do you formally condone police brutality? Will you publicize alternatives to calling the police? Will you resist police intervention and presence at protests in, its in our neighborhoods? And will you demand that if police must be present at demonstrations in this area, the officers responsible to main, to abstain from physical force or arrests. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Taylor. I don't know if you have an answer to that, Captain Smith, or again, I Taylor. That will be the same answer. You know, I encourage any dialogue. You know, we are here. You know, we'll take the call. We'll initiate any conversations you'd like to have. Thank you. Good. Thank you. There was one other. Can I stick my two cents in? Captain Smith, thank you so much, but people are asking and having the, wanting to have the dialogue now, and I appreciate maybe you're being blindsided, but you're not having a dialogue. And I, I don't think this is the forum for that conversation. I mean, would would your talk. meeting be the forum for the conversation? Where would it be? That's okay. That's fair. That's a fair statement. Well, it, it's a start. You know, reach out to us, reach out to our neighborhood coordination offices, let us get to know you, and we'll sit down. When the COVID restrictions are lifted, then uh, we'll we'll have these conversations. Okay. All righty. We will. There was one other person. It was Catherine. Hi, my name's Catherine. Um, I just want to say I don't have a statement, but I categorically disagree with the premise of the first statement by Leslie, and I kind of thought this was a quality of life meeting. Um, in my opinion, the police are the only ones that are working to keep us safe right now, and I don't have much faith in our elected officials in the city to do so. Two things. The Artisan Hotel. If it is not a homeless hotel, who is in that hotel that we are having five gun arrests in a day and police needing to be stationed out front on a regular basis? And two, when you started the call, you spoke about the homeless and if there's no criminality happening. I'm a little confused because it's fuzzy to me now what is criminality and what is not because people sleeping in ATM vestibules is apparently no longer a criminal act. People urinating on the street is apparently no longer a criminal act. What is a criminal act and what are you allowed to get involved in? I'll start with the artisan hotel. We have a trend of outer borough youths coming in taking advantage of these reduced rates and uh, with that being said we have a lot of these youths who are affiliated with gangs the crypts and the bloods you know so you have uh you have uh, conflicting sects of each of these gangs that you know that converge on these hotels in the city and with that being said you know parties are, are recovering and you know with, with any any large gathering like that there's always going to be some Type of an altercation that will escalate to violence. So that's what we've been noticing. Um, as I said, Sal Loria is working with us. He's taken many steps to work with us. Um, his his cameras have been very helpful to us, and just his overall cooperation. And we're looking to expand that with uh, any other hotels we're having issues with in the area right now. Um, there are no other hotels that we're having these incidents with. And uh, if we do send sense to that. We are going to have some issues, you know, we're going to redeploy our resources. So we have a lot of resources dedicated to the Artisan Hotel right now. We have a lot of surveillance on that location. And uh, most importantly, we have a lot of cooperation with that location. And so maybe you can address in regards to urination, public urination and defecation. What is the position that the police, what are the police allowed to do? 
Well, you know, it, it, it's not our position to take enforcement on certain issues like that. What we're looking to do is, you know, provide services and provide help. You know, we don't want to go in there and just penalize everybody. You know, everybody has an issue that they're struggling with, and uh, you know, we're trying to we're trying to come up with a permanent solution. You know, temporary summonses uh, and issues issuance of these uh, violations doesn't seem to be working, for, obviously. So we're trying to take alternative means. We're trying to get these individuals the help they need. Okay. So, Catherine, I don't know. We need to have further discussion, and this is something. Of course, we're getting a new mayor, and you know there are there are other. We this is a conversation that needs to be continued. Um, Mariama, is is your hand up? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Um, so first of all, thank you, of course, um, Captain, for for coming. Welcome to the first precinct and to Community Board One. Thank you. I wanted to ask if you had any type of information or update, understanding and respecting that you're not, uh, the, the MTA is in your jurisdiction. Do you know anything? It's a viral video today going on, uh, going around about a man that was beaten up by police at Whitehall Station. Um, do you know anything about this? Are you able to give an update? I apologize. I don't have any of the details. I haven't had a, an opportunity to speak with uh, Captain Brown about the incident, and uh, you know I wouldn't want to make any statements without having the facts. I apologize for not no, having. No, I appreciate that. I respect that. You know, um, if you want, you could contact my community affairs officers, and you know when I have the time to have that conversation, I should be able to provide you more details. I know, I know Officer Nelson. I have his card in my wallet. So thank you. I'll, 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 Sorry, I'll, I can't answer that now. You know? I'll, that's I, want to get a I don't want to make any assumptions. Okay. I also wanted to thank Matthew for his comment. I mean, I, a bunch of us walked around like feeling like we were kind of crazy when our, when our neighbors telling us that we were when we were going, we could have gotten way ahead of some of this stuff, you know, um, that's been going on in the community since before the summer um, and, and sort of culminated um, last May. And now it's all validated. It's all it's all been validated by the mayor, his reports, like I said, the AG, the IG, every, everybody now. Um, so I hope that we can finally get to it. I appreciate Matthew's comment. Thank you. That's all I wanted to say on this. On this. I think Thanks again, that, officer. Um, I think maybe next month. My pleasure. Have a great evening. Um, just, is your hand still up? Or? My hand's still up. Thank you, Pat. Now, I wanted to let everybody else have a chance because I saw so many people in the community wanting to speak, and I'm glad we heard two different perspectives. Um, so, um, Captain, thank you so much for coming again, and I'm sorry that part of the questions that you're presented with have been um, kind of pushing you and, and, and accusatory because you're walking into a new job at a new position, and I appreciate that. But I guess part of what I'd like this community board and particularly this committee to take up is to kind of get a balance between an awareness. And, and I will say, I was so thankful for your answer about the urinating in public and defecating in public. I cannot imagine anybody chooses to do that. I imagine that there's no place else for them to go. And thank you for not arresting people or making that a crime. Not because I want to see people urinating on the street or I want to be stepping in shit. I don't. I think it's horrifying. I think, but I think the answer is that we need to do better as a city and a country and whatever else. And that's beyond the police. But, um, but we need to do better and give people a place to go to the bathroom. That doesn't have to be the street. Um, so step one. But step two, one of my questions to you is, is as you're protecting us and protecting our neighborhoods, and thank you for you and your officers doing that every single day, um, realize that as Mariama's question asked, even that guy, whoever he was who was being arrested and punched in, in the Whitehall Street subway, he too is what, someone who you're protecting and serving within reason. Now, I don't know any of the details of what happened and why he was arrested and, and what was going on and no comments there. But I guess part of what I would like as a mother, as a resident of, of um, Battery Park City and Community Board 1, just as a human being, how do we look at stuff like that? Or look at the, looking out my window and seeing um, protesters being 
I'm going to sorry, but the word is attacked because that is what I saw. How do we reconcile that with the same image of the same police that came and protected us and put their lives on the line and died for us on 9 11? Died for me. I mean, they were there. There. I mean, I was there. They were there. And, and, I guess the, com the the conversation I want to have is how can we all be on the same side because we should be, and and that's where I want to go. So with everything else that everybody's saying and saying pushing you one way, my answer back is I think we all need to be on the same side because having safe communities also means safe for people of color, and it does mean holding people who break the law accountable. And I don't know how that balance is, but I think that that's the conversation that we should be having. And I thank you for being here and, and I'd love and invite when we can have that conversation. And I know it's a lot of conversations and it's not here, but I appreciate that. Thank you. I want to thank you for that comment. And, and I agree with you, you know, it's, it's more than just, uh, you know, on the surface issues that it seems, you know, we do need to have that conversation. Uh, I hope to be in this community for a long time. I don't aspire to go anywhere else. Very happy here for the past two months. And with that being said, you know, I look forward to uh, continuing these relationships and starting these conversations. You know, I don't plan on going anywhere. So, you know, we all have to live in this community together. And, uh, you know, I think it starts with a conversation and just, you know, having some face time. And, and even as far as if you want us to walk around with you and point things out to us, we may not see every day as we're driving by or, or responding to certain incidents. You know, I, I welcome that, uh, that dialect and I welcome that relationship and that collaboration. You know, so please, you know, reach out to my neighborhood coordination officers, come to the Zoom meeting, you know, use these numbers that we provide and, and use our platforms, the social media, just for, for knowledge and, and respond and comment. And, you know, let's, let's, let's listen to each other and let's work on this together as a community. Exactly. I, again, I'm going to thank you so much for coming and giving us your time. And I encourage Everyone to attend the uh, police community council meeting because that's, that's where we can also start the, some dialogue and continue dialogues. And we um, we thank you and good night. We'll see you on February twenty fifth. Thank you, everybody. Be safe. Stay safe. Okay. Uh, is everyone hearing feedback? Yes, I'm hearing some feedback and some some static, Pat. There's static or something, yeah. It, it, I don't know, Lucian, is it me or what's going on? <laughs> this could be one of those things. Maybe what, there's a lot of WebEx meetings going on. Maybe it's a storm, you know, there, there's all sorts of right. you know, factors that could be affecting the what's going so, on on the other end. I, I, I wouldn't say it's you. Everyone else is me. It's me. <laughs> It's that always you. <laughs> no, it's not you. <laughs> All right, so let's move on. So Sounds we're, like we're, going, we're heading off to hear how our projects in in uh, CB1 are doing. So who do we have from DDC? Hi. We have everyone. Um, so I just want to ask really quick, um, our DDC friends who are not panelists yet, could you please raise your hand and I'll move you over? Um, That's bad. Right there, who's ever who's ever involved right now? It's coming from something amongst those of these people. Yeah, everybody, turn off your your uh, mute. That's one thing. And, uh, okay. Well, is, okay. We're gonna have to try to just get through this uh, as best we can. Um, so, how am I doing now? Is it terrible? Really bad. Well. All right, let me try taking off these earbuds. Give me one second. Okay. All right, let's try this way. Is it any better? Sounds like a little bit better. Yeah. Okay. Excuse my okay. All right, so it's, it was me. <clears throat> um, if you're here from DDC, uh, I see you, Sonia, but I, since you're on the phone, I can't move you over. Um, if anyone else from the project team? Um, uh, any DC project or EDC project for that matter. If you're not yet a panelist, raise your hand. And we'll Lucian. Hey, yeah. Lucian, this is Frankie Lau from DDC. Hey, Frankie, you want to get started? Frankie. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I think Walkman Walkman Wong is also on on the call. Yeah. I don't know. If right, he's over. Start. I got him. I'm here yep. too, Lucian. Yep, yep, yep. Hey, hey, why, why don't we just go ahead and start, uh, Frankie? Why don't you just go ahead and uh, 
You're you're Worth Street now, right? You no, I'm uh, I'm Front Street. Yeah. Why don't we start with Front Street then, Frankie? Okay, so hey. so hi Pat. Uh, hi Pat. <laughs> so uh, the project is uh, still moving along. We're still right now we're on Front Street and the intersection of Front and Wall. Uh, we've run into uh, quite a few Con Edison and ECS uh, interferences at that intersection, so we should be there for a little bit. Uh, you know, we're still moving north. Uh, the schedule is still uh, June of 2022, but th that's about it. I don't have anything. Um, anything else, uh, Amelia? Do you have anything? Uh, no, pretty much that's it. We're at that intersection for a, another couple of weeks, and then we'll continue moving down front. And yeah, that's so, what we're planning right now. Yeah, so that, so that intersection, there's 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 steam issues there. There's gas issues. There's electric issues, and there's uh, ECS issues. So so we're gonna be there for that for for a little bit, uh, and th and then later on we have to double back to the Gouverneur intersection because we bypass that uh, intersection. Uh, a couple of months ago, but we have to go back there and then and then we'll continue north. But uh, other than that, uh, everything's just moving along. I still think you're going to finish June of 2022. So that's good. Yes, for yeah. now. You'll update us next time. I will um, update you next time. Yeah. Okay. And Con Ed's working well with you and your. Yeah, well, I have no I have no issues with Con Edison. They're responsive. They've been responsive. Um, you know when issues come up and you know they're moving. You know they're getting issues and they're trying to resolve whatever issues that's come up. So so you know you, you guys will be the first ones I uh I reach out to if uh, if they're not playing nice. Okay, great. Frankie, yeah. uh, Frankie and Amelia, can I just cut in really quick? Uh, sure. I want to take a step back really uh, quick. We, we had a question. I think it's important. We've been at this for so long with uh, DDC and Con Edison that I think um, it's important to kind of set the table a little bit. Um, uh, the DDC stands for the Department of Design and Construction. They're the city agency that is responsible for um, undertaking the unenviable task of uh, implementing huge infrastructure projects. Um, sometimes agencies go about it on their own, but in projects where there's just a, a huge amount of complexity, DEC is the agency that will oversee it, uh, work with all its partners with DOT, uh, with the Department of Environmental Protection, which manages our sewers and water, potable water supply, with Con Edison for steam, gas, and electricity, with Verizon for fiber optics, um, and um, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's a it's a huge mess under those streets. You know, it's unbelievable amount of pipes and conduits, um, and um, there's a lot of uh, snags as they open up the streets. And you know, we've learned all about that here. So uh, every other month, the uh, quality of life committee um, walks through the progress in any sorts of community snags, um, whether it's sound, vibration, um, you know, uh, uh, issues with with timing. Um, we work that out here, and we've, I think we've had a lot of success with that. So that's why uh, we're here today. It sounds like everything's smooth, but in the past, we've really worked out some really tangled issues in this committee. So I just want to give everyone a, an idea of, of what, what it is that is being discussed now. Now, Frankie and Amelia, we're going to ask that you stay until EDC presents because uh, the, the Water Street project is very close to you, and we want to make sure that um, – that uh, we, we we have that coordinated between EDC and DDC. Sure. Let sure. Me add, With that, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna be quiet. No, I was gonna say, let me just add something to Lucian's statement. Also, to the public members, uh, public, this is the time when if you're, you're having an issue with any of the projects, you know that either there's rats or there's no, off hour noise or anything. That this is the time that you would come to the Quality of Life Committee to discuss it with the people who are representing these agencies. So just so you know that. Okay, moving along. Next project, Worth Street. Hello, this is Walkman Wong with DDC. I'll, I'll talk about Worth Street and uh, we'll start with that. Yes, um, on uh, Church Street, that's our main intersection where we're having a lot of trouble. We still are working on the gas and steam mains that have to be moved Sorry, Walkman. Away. Was this Church Street and Worth? Yeah, Church and Worth intersection. Yeah. Okay, and they've been working on it. Uh, they're ongoing, but 
it's still they're still working on uh, putting the uh, I think the get the steam main in the service. Or it was a yeah, and they also have to um, install once they move that. They have to also rebuild two con ed manholes on the east side of of uh, church and work. Then they gotta install the thirty inch uh, water main across uh, Church Street. They gotta install a twenty inch water main across Church Street. They gotta do all the traffic signals, got all the underground cables and whatnot for the electrical part of that. Um, concrete base and final paving. So all that stuff still has to be done in church, and mostly um, it still uh, depends on uh, the work that Con Ed has to do before we can actually go in and do our work. Right. So, so at I'll this location, we're talking. We're hoping that it might be done by the end of the year. I'm sorry. Now, what? What this this intersection? This intersection, yes. Now, well, but this might be the last part of the project to be done. Uh, the other only other location that we're talking about is Broadway and West Street, and that's basically working on the final restoration of there, where we have to get a, a engineered pavement. That goes over the top of con ed lines, which are very high. So we, we sent that in, it got approved by. Uh, our design people and everything and now. Well, they were going to start working on uh, putting in that uh, pavement over on Broadway. Okay. But it, with what this weather, it's kind of hard to do. Are you broke up when you said which location it was? Uh, that was on the corner of uh, Broadway and West Street. I still didn't hear. Uh, the corner of Broadway and Worth. Uh, uh, Broadway, you know, Broad, sorry. Broadway and Worth. Okay, yes. sorry. Yes. Okay. And then and, you broke up when you said when you thought. So the date that you gave the end of the year. What was that day for? No, that's uh, probably December twenty twenty one. Both of these locations probably probably, but church will be the. Probably the last location to be completed on this job. Everything else on the project is complete. From Hudson to uh, West Broadway has been paved, and from like east, just east of Broadway all the way out to uh, Park Row has been finished and completely paved. Great. So these are the only two locations that are left, and the section between uh, West Broadway and Church on Worth, that section, you know, is pending that intersection work. So you think at the end of 2021 we'll get the street back? That's that's what I'm hoping. Uh, okay. It depends on how you know how fast Con Ed gets their work done, so we can do ours. But the other thing is too, if we get to the end point where near December, then we can't do paving in December because it's too cold to put down asphalt. Yeah. So yeah. you might have to wait till spring. So it all depends on the timing. If we get in there and get our work done early enough. Uh, you know, we may be able to do the asphalt and, and the concrete base, but it all depends on if we if we can get utilities out of the way first. Right. And that's that's the main crux. Okay. As you all know. Yeah. So then I mean we'll see you before just September twenty twenty. Oh, sure. So if you'll sure. let us know how it's going. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, I got another thing I just wanted to mention uh, from Rio Centeno and us at the construction part of DDC. We really uh, would like to thank you for um, recognition of Marcia Guido and her work on the Bogardis project. Uh, it's really nice to see hard work and good work, really good work, uh, get recognized by the neighborhood, you know, the people. So good. we want to thank you for that. And thank you. Yes, great. All righty. So we're moving along. Next project. Yes. Uh, I got a thing on Vestry Street. Um, they're basically the only thing they have to do now is they have to do a little change order work, which is to fill out some old sewers that were abandoned. Uh, they were abandoned before we got there. We didn't realize it, so now they want us to fill them up and get rid of them and stuff. So that's going to be probably in the upcoming months, and then in the spring they're going to start doing the cobblestone road on Vestry Street. So the their estimated date for that ending to be complete is June of 2021, and um, we're we're hoping that that holds. But you know, 
June of 2021. Now, I know, um, is Mark here? Do we have Mark here tonight? Mark who, Amoruso? Uh -huh. No, Mark Amoruso is not, uh, he can't join us tonight. Okay, so I know that Mark is always talking about the cobblestones. So, uh, and you know, you heard this conversation from Mark before. Well, about the cobblestones. Um, are, are the, is this a new contract in the cobblestones? <coughs> way of uh, they will last well this is uh jlj they they do uh pretty good work um i'm trying to think if they've done uh other cobblestones within the area of manhattan down here in lower manhattan i don't know if they i i really couldn't say if they've done it before i don't know well, okay. but <laughs> this is Lucian. i know they're a very good contractor I would just ask that um, when you're nearing the end of the contract, once the cobblestone work is complete, um, please invite us if you can for a walkthrough so we can just take a look at it. Um, it'll really put the community minds at ease, um, and you know it'll help us ensure that you know I know that ABC is doing a longer curing process now than, than in the that may what may have been done um, in the uh, other streets in Tribeca area that have the poor. Uh, cobblestone condition that I yes. from what I've what I've ga gathered is that the, the cure time was not adequate and perhaps the the um, the material they used wasn't wasn't adequate. So I know you guys are going to do a good job, but I think it would just be helpful to close the loop with the community if we could take a walk through once that work is complete, so we can see it for ourselves. Because I know that there's only so much time at the completion of the project where the city is able to get in and say that. Uh, the work needs be may need to be redone or something like that. Right. Okay, and, that's not a problem. Well, we set did, that up. Did do you know if there was a conversation held with the cobblestone contractor so that they know that we've had a problem before in the area and they know what to look out for? Well, I, I think that the cobblestone I, I can't really speak for it because I don't know exactly which subcontractor to use in. So I, I can't really say, mm -hmm. but I'm sure we'll get to talk to them before they start in the springtime. Okay, yeah, just if you could just make them aware that we have had an issue with the cobblestones in our community. They were delayed. They what they lasted like five years, and then they started coming up. We've had uh, a person have serious injury because of those cobblestones, and so mm -hmm. you know we just want to make sure. And it's also taxpayers' money, which includes everybody's money. We want oh, to make sure. sure that we don't have to pay to have it done like ten times. Definitely, I understand. Thank you. Okay, moving along. Okay, uh, I'm not sure which other projects you want to update on because I have other people online that could answer those questions on those other projects. So, if you name a project, someone will hopefully will come online and discuss it. If well, I think EDC is going to talk about Wall Street, right? Hello? Me? Can we lose Wall Street? I'm wondering if I can ask him a question. Sure. What what is your position like like not 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 your your opinion but your position with Bogart's Gardens because this might be a a suggestion that's not a, not for, for your uh, position. Uh, I'm the director of infrastructure construction for Manhattan for DDC. So okay. that was one of the projects under me. Right, and it's very nice. Just make like you know they have like some signs you know say no no bicycles no skateboards et cetera et cetera. I mean I I, I walk by there all the time. The signs are very, they look very nice, but they're not visible from both entry points. If you're, if you're coming, uh, if you're entering on the Chamber Street side, or if you're entering on the Reed Street side, they're kind of more in the middle of Bogarda's Gardens facing the building. And so it would be un invisible to anybody coming from like the entry points. Mitch, I think, um, um, Lucian, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the sign of DOTs Okay. I, I didn't know if it was appropriate for this gentleman, so I just, you know. No, I, I think uh, the DOT kind of wants those signs in a certain areas, I'm assuming. But okay, the other well, thing is also is probably the signs are in the area where they don't want you to roller skate. Like, I know they have these, uh, like, anti not roller skate, but skateboard. 
No problem. I understand that. that it, the signs are a little more effective for the skateboarders, but it would be impossible to fault any bicyclists going through from Chambers to, uh, and then out the Reed Street exit okay. because the sign would not be legible. Well, okay. since the, the park is complete, I will definitely take that up with both parks and DOT um, because uh, I'm unsure of whose jurisdiction okay. it is, but Mitch, if you send me an email about it, I'll forward it to both of them and we'll work it out. That's it's not the end of the world. I just, you know, no, all right, thanks. It's, it's, a, it's a legitimate uh, uh, observation. So I'll, I'll make sure to get both agencies working on that. Now, is everybody having as hard a time hearing as I am? Uh, me, I am. <laughs> yes, I am. Is everybody who's not speaking muted? I, I think, think we need to do that. But I don't know, but I think you're exactly right. That's the problem. I'm having a really hard time hearing. Okay, I'm sorry. It sounds well, bad tonight. Most of that, but is there any uh, what other projects? Um, can anyone other projects? Yes, I'd like to ask about the Nassau Street. What's planned? Go for oh. it, Betty. Na I'm sorry, Nassau Street? Oh, also, yes, Rose is here about that, too. Yeah. Okay, Um, this is Frankie Lau again. Um. From my understanding, the Nassau Street project, the design was delayed due to the pandemic. So, so th I think they just re-ramped back up the design. They haven't completed design as of yet. So, all of that, um, a lot of those projects uh, schedules have been pushed back. Do you, do you know? know pushed back? I'm sorry. Excuse me. Do you happen to know what's included on that project? Yes, it's um, it's roadway reconstruction, full roadway reconstruction, and sidewalk and pedestrian ramps uh, from the from Maiden Lane. So pretty much from the Federal Reserve all the way to Pine Street. Okay, so it is okay. Thank you. You up? You up? Rosa, you here? Thank you. Is <laughs> Rosa? Yeah, I would, love, about that project? yeah I would love to know regarding the Nassau Street project, what is the estimated start time and then the duration of work? Um, I, again, I don't know uh, because I don't think, I don't believe the design is completed. I think it's, it's, it's close to being completed. So uh, I, I would say that's at least a two year project, but again, I, I won't know until you know that comes to us after after design has been completed. Okay, right? so, so you don't you don't know whether it's anticipated to start in twenty. No, no. Again, everything everything got pushed back uh, because of the pandemic. I think the next one, the next project to start up is 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 actually going to be Greenwich. Um, Nassau oh. was pushed back, and the, everything okay. else got pushed back. Okay, thank you. So, um, Frankie, you know, two, uh, and also was it two months from now, we'll, we'll ask DDC to come back and maybe they'll have some update on the design. Okay, 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 great. Frankie, what what is this about the what's going on with Greenwich Street? Greenwich, <laughs> um, I actually went out to bid. It went out to bid uh, last week. Um, uh, so it's it's the design is complete. Uh. I think pretty much it's going out. They're, they're looking at construction start um, late this year. I would say early next year. And just tell us. The, the, I'm sorry, I'm choking. Just tell us from what street to what street the length. This is uh, on Greenwich from Barclay all the way to Chambers. So it picks up where Chambers Street completed, uh, and it goes south towards the the Trade Center, um, okay. up to Barclay. And any idea how long a project it will be? I believe it's three years. Three years. Yeah. <laughs> God, I'm getting older and grayer here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so you'll let us know when you come back. And yeah, yeah. So, so they assigned me that one. So, so you get me again on that one. Okay. And any other any anybody have any other request questions? Pat, it's it's Alice. Hi, thanks, Hi, Alice. Alice. Uh, how are you? I'm coming late to the party here, but I just want to understand what exactly is the project? Um, have we seen a design? Is it more? Could you just, I'm sorry if you've already said it, it, it nope. a brief description Evan. of what this Greenwich Street project consists of. Oh, it, it's it's a full roadway reconstruction. So they're pretty much redoing the full, the roadway. Um, you're getting new utilities, new sidewalks, and it is a, uh, they're doing some sidewalk uh, amenities and extensions. Uh, it's, that's included. I'm only asking because recently the community board has been presented with 
other Department of Transportation work that's proposed just north of there from Barkley to Murray. Is mm -hmm. this um, are you aware of that yeah. work? Yes, or? that's the right. That's, that's that's the I think they propose the realignment of the sidewalks. Uh, well, we haven't actually had the presentation on the, the, on the on the sidewalks, but that could be. I know there's bollards that are being proposed uh, along the site, the 240 Greenwich Street site, which is going from Barclay to Murray. But I'm, okay. is there a way? Is there a place that we can see the um, plans of? What's being proposed here, or what? I, I don't. I don't have the final plans that uh, they weren't given to me as of yet. Uh, looking at the looking at the unfinished un, unfinished set a few months back. Uh, again, there was, you know, um, there was upgrades to utilities. Um, there, there's. I think they're bumping out. They're bumping out a portion of the sidewalk um, to to align the sidewalk. So you have the straight run, you know, the winding sidewalk. So they. Uh, right. You know, it would probably be helpful, and I don't know, um, Pat and um, Lucian, if this is possible to maybe get these plans and maybe have them as part of the sort of a, maybe a land use look at them because, you know, they kind of work with that 240 Grand Street site in a way that might be helpful. Okay, are, are they? It's that 240 Grand Street site. Is I'm it a sorry. private construction site? Well, the, the the site is, but the the sidewalk is the public part of it. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yes. So okay. and maybe in two months' time, Frankie, maybe you can give us a, a you know a, a presentation on what the project consists of. Um, I could get a, like a rough uh, write up. I could put it together like a rough write up. But if you want like like a presentation, I, I would have to wait until I get the final set to kind of or or have Ocon put something together. I don't know how well, that works. Start with Maybe you can outline for us, you know, you've already said it was, you know, complete reconstruction. Yes. Um, so to start, maybe you can just like, yeah, give us a bullet point list of what they're intending to do. And then maybe when you get the plans, you can okay. come back. I can so, do that. Thanks, Pat. Thank you, sir. No, no problem. problem. Welcome to the dance. <laughs> um, if there are no more current projects already going on, can I ask if we move? I mean, I'm usually a proponent for letting everybody say whatever they have to say as long as they need to say it. But I have neighbors they need to start jumping off and we haven't gotten anywhere near the housing issues right. yet. Okay. So uh where are we? We've we get we're anything else or should we go to Water Street? I had a quick question. This is Rosa. Um I, I was wondering if there if there has been any kind of a more sort of holistic analysis of how we can approach the work that needs to be done for the infrastructure projects on our streets because I feel like no matter where I'm walking in, in New York City something might be under construction or repair or redo and then it's you know patched up again and then two months later there somebody else is in there maybe even the same crew um, going in again and again and again. And it seems incredibly inefficient and incredibly expensive. And I'm wondering, as, as well as um, obviously very inconvenient, I'm wondering, has there been any consideration to how we can just better approach this overall as a city since our infrastructure is in the ground? How to better address that so that it is something that perhaps is more accessible, more easily maintainable, repairable? That may be a larger discussion, but. Yeah, I think it might be, <laughs> and that requires. You know, I think like we used to have a construction kind of czar down here for projects that were going on. Not necessarily, you know, infrastructure projects. The city might need that to coordinate projects. You know, um, I don't well, know. This is a uh, walking one here. I just wanted to say that there's a lot of times where uh, we have to go in there, and first we have to move the utilities out of the way. So that might be like the initial excavation that you see. And then once they're out of the way, then we can come back and do our work. So there's there's a couple different phases in that where like like just on the intersection of church and Worth Street, we've been there a long time. It's just that it's taken so long to move everything out of the way. And you know, that's sometimes that's what you see is you, you come in and move a, a communication line. Then you come in and move a gas line. You come in and move a steam line. So you have multiple excavations in the same area, but they're they're excavating to get rid of 
other things. And most not the same thing at all times. So yeah. sometimes that's what you might see where you see everybody coming back and coming back. Uh, you know, that that could be what you are are noticing, but it's not that we're like uh, haphazardly doing this. It's that you have to move this out of the way first, then you can get to the other thing to move that out of the way. And by the time you get everything out of the way, then the city can actually come in and do their work. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that might be what you are seeing in terms of multiple excavations. Right. I'm sure that is a huge part of what I'm seeing. I guess what I'm wondering is if there has been sort of a higher level thinking about how we could approach the infrastructure in our city a little bit better so that it's perhaps a more modern or contemporary way of looking at it rather than, you know, this is just the way we keep doing it because that's how it was built originally. Um, you know, Rose, only because of time, can we- No, can I totally come, get it. Can we're I good, just we're good. something? Can you back to us with that conversation? Hi, this is Liz. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Elizabeth, hi. Hi, Liz. hi. Uh, just from a, a, lay, a lay person's perspective and a, a CCL who's been around long, um, a lot of times, because we can't fully close streets, especially with downtown and the uh, traverse of traffic from east to west and all that stuff, it's the best, not so great way. Because to have everyone be in there at the same time, you would have to create a desert like situation. That's it. <laughs> Thanks, Liz. <laughs> Yeah, um, Rosa, let's have the conversation again. Let's go back to that because maybe we need a, to talk about that and uh, possibly write a resolution make, with a proposal. But can we visit that uh, at another meeting so we can move along? Of course. Of sure. course. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So, um, everybody. There were some hands up from the attendees. I don't know if they're still up from the other item or if they're newly up. They're new. Um, I have Sonia uh, Quinones. Um, who's actually the in CCL here. for Vestry Street. So I'm going to unmute her in case she wants to add anything. But Sonia, um, I think we're good on Vestry Street if you're okay. Yes, we're not having any issues there. Again, as to reiterate what Walkman uh, mentioned earlier, we're waiting for the weather uh, to warm up in order for them to start the um, the restoration of the of the roadway there. As well as to work on the um, on closing of some some sewers there. Um, as far as the community is concerned, there hasn't been any issues with the community. Okay, thank you. All You're right. welcome. Let's move to thank you, everybody. And I don't know if you're hanging around to talk about Water Street or hear about Water. Street. Can we move to Water Street, please? Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, you here from the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Hope you're all doing well. Uh, so we, uh, although DDC, like Lucian said, is the lead for much of the capital construction throughout the city, occasionally we, we jump in and do some construction, in particular when there are um, local agencies and, and other private parties involved. So we'll get into that. Uh, my colleague Steve Nelson is here as well. So uh, Lucian, can you confirm that Steve is can also have video and Audio. You can unmute yourself. I'm here. Hey, Steve. Hi, well. So thanks, uh, Pat and Lucian and uh, everyone on the committee for having us tonight. Um, we are, uh, this is the, um, uh, like the folks from DVC said, uh, there were a, a number of capital projects of ours that were paused because of the pandemic. This was one that was potentially ready to go into construction uh, summer 2020, but of course we had to put that on hold. Um, so, uh, I'm excited to, sh uh, Lucian, can I share my screen? I don't, it's kind of great out for me right now. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna put up a presentation here, uh, but this is the Water Street Streetscape uh, Improvement Plan. Uh, Steve will get into the details, but generally um, this is a project with a lot of folks at the table. Uh, we're collaborating with the uh, Downtown Alliance on this, um, as well as the Department of Transportation and a number of other Entities, and I think generally, um, we're really excited to begin work. Um, it's going to be uh, a scope that probably takes about 18 to 24 months. So we do want to make sure and stay in touch with the community board in regard to what's going on. Um, probably right now, looking at starting later this spring, so April or May, somewhere in there. Of course, we'll keep you updated. 
uh, but we wanted to get you as much information as we had uh, right now. So with that, Steve, I'm going to turn it over to you for uh, the slides and just tell me when you want me to advance. Sure. Uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity. So our project uh, is along the Water Street corridor from Whitehall up to Fulton Street. Um, and we are building out um, a new plaza down at Whitehall and um, reconstructing an, uh, another plaza at Quinty Slip. Uh, you can uh, turn the next slide. Um, uh, the goals are we're trying to create a more pedestrian oriented environment uh, that will encourage more people to walk and gather along, uh, hopefully post pandemic. Um, you know, we're going to be widening the sidewalks, uh, having more pedestrian bump outs, uh, bus bulbs and bus pads. Um, I said the new, the new plaza and we're doing some geogra geometric realignment of water street and then some full depth, uh, reconstruction of the street in, uh, select intersections. All right, next slide. Um, this is a rendering uh, of what is existing at uh, Whitehall Street currently right now. It's that painted uh, DOT pavement um, with some of the planters. Uh, but on the right is our proposed rendering from our design team, uh, NV5. Um, so it's definitely a more inviting, more uh, uh, nice green space. Um, we will also be uh, reconstructing uh, Moore Street in between those two buildings there. Um, and the uh, the plaza will be integrated within Moore Street as well. So uh, trucks delivering up into uh, Moore Street can, and cars can still pass through. Next slide. Uh, Quinty Slip, uh, similar thing. We have the, the painted uh, kind of plaza area with some seating. Um, however, we're going to build up, you know, with uh, new pavers and, and, and sidewalks, um, a little bit more pedestrian friendly and a little bit more inviting for the shops that are and uh, restaurants that are currently there. Uh, the current uh, sculpture there is remaining um, and we are coordinating with uh, parks, uh, NYC parks on that. Uh, next slide. Uh, the organization, um, we are closely working with, uh, DOT and, uh, downtown Alliance. Um, they are kind of our partners in this. However, we have coordinated, uh, vastly with New York city parks and New York city DEP, uh, as well. Um, however, EDC is the implementing agency. And our consultants are uh, from the design team is NV5, who actually are locals to to the area. Their office is on Old Slip. Um, the resident engineer who will be doing uh, construction oversight is Techno Consult Consultants. Um, and then we just are uh, awarding and registering the contract for the general contractor, which is Jay Pizzaruso Landscaping Corporation. Next slide. Um, again, this is just an overall work uh, of the, the contract, uh, the two plazas, um, the, the the pedestrian safety uh, with the corner bulb outs and the uh, shortened crosswalks. Uh, we're widening the sidewalks as well. The reconstruction at Moore Street. We are doing some water main rerouting uh, at Quinty Slip. Um, so there will be some water main work. Um, and then we will also be doing a lot of utility <coughs> modifications um, that have been previously discussed in the other projects with DDC as well. So Con Ed, ECS, uh, Charter. Um, so those are the major utilities that we are working with. And then we'll be doing some work with uh, New York City Transit to just ensure that we're not disturbing any of their underground infrastructure. Next slide. Um, this is just a snapshot of where what we're anticipating. We're actually anticipating a possible March to April start. Um, it could be May, just depending um, on our registration of the contract. Just 
because uh, things with the city are a little slow right now. Um, we are anticipating 18 to 24 months of construction. Um, our resident engineer will have a hotline and an email address for any community concerns. We will definitely share that uh, next time we come back to do an update for you guys. Um, so if there's any concerns, um, you can always reach that uh, that hotline or email address and they will get to both Will and myself and other members of the, the team to address anything. Um, the resident engineer will have a community liaison to be in contact with all the local businesses. Um, the contract hours, uh, we do have uh, stipulations from DOT on work hours that I've laid out here. Um, we just don't know at the moment what our contractor schedule will look like. Um, we're hoping to get that in the next week or so, and we'll definitely share a more detailed schedule uh, to come. But we'll make sure we adhere to all the regulations regarding noise and air pollution. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. I think um, just a couple a couple items to note. Um, I know that we when we were sort of um, uh, working the process for this for this project, we were going before the transportation committee. So I, I do have our other uh, another presentation that we previously sh previously showed here. Uh, if anybody has any specific design questions, um, I think our last meeting was in Lucian. Is it was it February of last year? It's it's it was just before the pandemic, I think. Um, in addition to that, uh, like 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 Steve said, we are we are trying to come to you early, so we don't have a lot of of specifics for, uh, within the DOT steps. This is sort of the maximum extent of of work hours. Um, once we get you know everything through the controller's office and get the contract registered, uh, once the resident engineer gets uh, a site office, which they're looking for right now, that kind of stuff, we're going to have um, a lot more clarity and specificity on what the actual work hours are going to look like. Um, and then, of course, who to contact. Um, the community construction liaison is called Strategies. Um, they actually have an office. Uh, their headquarter office is on Broadway, um, right across from the the Charging Bull statue. So they're very familiar with the area, and uh, we've done we've we've gotten a lot of good work from them in the past. And there are no residents there, right? So, what's that? There are no residents living there. Yeah, I'm not sure if there's yeah. So the noise right. night noise won't be bothering any residents unless I'm mistaken and maybe the committee knows. I don't think there are any residents there. Uh, Amelia, the Amelia, the do you know offhand if there is a residence along the there is residents along the Water Street corridor, correct? Amelia? Yes. yes, there are. Plus you have the hotels. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. So we have hotels on front and and I think when we did our pre-con, uh they a lot of those business um, high rises, they were converted to some of them were converted to residential on, along the Water Street corridor. And the night hours maybe present a problem. We'll have to discuss. All right. Yeah. Um, well, we can probably pull the uh, the data for city planning and confirm. But uh, I think we should definitely move forward, uh, assuming that there are residents. Um, I think the one thing that we're going to look to speak with you about in the upcoming meeting is uh, really drilling down in, in the uh, overnight work. Uh, the weekend work, uh, and what types of um, uh, what types of work uh, you'll be uh, looking to do is just staging materials. Um, you know that's one thing, but I, you know when I hear overnight work, I'm thinking that you're going to be doing work in the street for you know, preservation of, of traffic. Um, and that's the case, then we have to kind of get an idea of the timelines, uh, a deeper dive of the timelines for that, so we have. Uh, uh, more of an idea of what to expect, and then um, for the for the weekend work uh, as well. Just try to make sure that it's not the noisy work. So um, these are all things that we can certainly um, you know, come to terms on, uh, as long as we're we're sure that everyone's doing what they can to minimize disruption, because uh, we do want this sure. project to be as short as possible. Also, yeah, that um, makes that makes sense, uh, Lucian. And, and if the, if you don't mind me mentioning one thing. I think I'll, just to note, um, as as Steve said, um, although the <clears throat> although the primary scope that the public is going to see as a result of the project is the, the improvements to the plazas, um, you know, sort of formalizing and, and making permanent what what right now is a lot of sort of temporary bump out space and kind of tap paving and that kind of stuff. 
Um, although the, the primary, you know, what we're going to see is, is those plazas and, and the sort of streetscape work, there is a pretty significant amount of, of subgrade utility work. Like Steve mentioned, there's also um, uh, a number of subway tunnels um, interacting with the private utilities that, you know, are going to be doing work as part of the project. So, um, yeah, we'll certainly get back to you, Lucia, but I, I just want to underscore that, yeah, there will be, uh, you know, some, some coordination issues on that. Yeah, and and uh, good luck in finding a, a good CCL for this project. Uh, we have certainly recommendations uh, with this resolution about it, uh, but definitely uh, uh, Marcia Guido, who just departed the Bogardis Plaza project, would be a great fit for something as invasive and intense as this project. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah, so, so actually, um, Techno has already retained CARP strategies, um, and we've had really good experience with them working on other projects, um, including some of the LMCR uh, resiliency portfolio. Got it. Sorry, I got thrown off, so I didn't, I didn't hear all of that, but Lucian, you can fill me in on it later. Yep, spam. Uh, Lucian, Lucian, can you hear me? Amelia? Yes, hi, just to Will and Steve, uh, once Amelia. you have, this is Amelia, I'm the liaison for the Front Street Project. I've been in contact with Catherine. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, Amelia, uh, Catherine is no longer on the project. Um, right. I, I do have your contact information. I do get, I do get your email blasts every Friday and I appreciate that. Um, so we can be in touch, um, a little bit more closely Please, when, when we're starting up. When you have the liaison too, uh, anything I can do to help, cause I may have some contacts that that person may need. I can always give them to her also. Uh, Appreciate it, and we're we're going to be meeting with Downtown Alliance in the next uh, few weeks as well. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Appreciate it, though. Thanks, Amelia. Appreciate that offer. Um, may I? Do you mind if I ask um, Pat and, and other members of the committee? Um, I know that other community boards do a, a district service cabinet, um, and I just wanted to see you know as we're working with the uh, with the resident engineer and their community construction liaison. You know, sort of what the what the community board's preferences are in terms of communication and, and meetings and that kind of thing. Because I think one thing to note is, you know, we just we do need to keep in mind sort of um, yeah, well, you know, we'll, we'll, the budget and scope. Yeah, we we will we'll have a, a spot reserved for uh, everyone from your project team who wants to make our monthly district service cabinet meetings. We have well, all the, the DC, CCLs present at that meeting, and so we'll look to have. Your CCL, and then maybe initially have if you want to send an RE, that's fine. But uh, the CCLs are so fantastic that we get tons and tons of work done at that meeting, and, and also we prep for this meeting here, and making sure that we, um, we we give them a line on any kind of community issues to work on. Um, so yeah, it, it's it. we we have a great um, uh, district service cabinet meeting, and we're absolutely thrilled to have everyone who wants to. Attend from your project, but just the CCL will work. Okay, great. And that's that's um, weekdays during the daytime, right? It's the uh, third Tuesday of the month at eleven. Third Tuesday. Okay, great. Um, we have a meeting with the CCL coming up, I think, next week. So just wanted to get them as much information as we could. Great. And then uh, us, if you, you know, if you have any updates every other month, we would ask you to come and join us. Okay. So yeah, for sure, we will. Any questions from the committee? I can't see. Any hands up? No. Well, you have Mr. you have Lisa Sam. Dickinson from the from the public and Cora Chin from I'm sorry, and Cora from Team Chim's office. Alice and Betty, are your hands up from before? Or are they new questions? And Rosa, I had a new question. Well, actually, I guess it's a comment. Um, I just want to. Confirm that there absolutely are residences along Water Street because I, I know a few families on there for sure. Yeah, so those late hours won't work. So we'll talk about that. Thanks, Rosa. Thank what you. about Betty and uh, who else was it? Betty and Betty, you a question, Betty? No, I took my hand down. Sorry. Alice, new question? Yeah, Pat, thanks. Uh, hi, Will. I just said hi, Alice. How are you? I just had a couple of questions. Um, 
how is this? I mean, maybe this isn't the place for them, um, but I'm just curious as how what the resiliency features are. Is this something that we can discuss maybe at, at our committee? I'm just curious how this works in with the five IC port plans, all the work that you're doing on the utilities. I think it'd be really interesting to uh, look at that. I don't know if that maybe is something that should be addressed specifically elsewhere. I don't want to take the time in this committee, but Ooh, I, yeah. I do think you it's might very important. To your committee. You want me to do that there? Could, could you come back and do that for us, Will? I'm like, yeah, I mean, Will, do you have and Steve, do you have? A yeah, question? I mean, the the two things I would I would ask maybe Steve to opine on on is is um, how NV how NV five the design firm uh, selected the pa the planting palette, and if that's um, you know sort of uh, you know had had the consideration of being um, you know in a coastal type environment, and then I think also just wanted to get Steve if you could confirm. Whether this project increases the amount of permeable area um, on those plazas versus what we're right now. So uh, the planting palette was chosen um, by the landscape architects uh, from NV5. They worked with uh, New York City Parks Department um, with, you know, the the trees that are are um, kind of laid out and asked to be used uh, for street trees. We are doing. Um, Silva cells in this project, which are um, it's a new type of way for planting street trees um, to allow the roots to grow under the sidewalk in a more holistic way without damaging and uprooting. Um, so uh, there's that. Um, and then in terms of, of uh, resiliency, this project predates uh, the FIDI Seaport Master Plan. Um, however, you know, we are always at EDC looking to uh, coordinate with all projects in our portfolios. Um, so I, I'm sure that the, I'm not on the FIDA Seaport Master Plan, I work on the BMCR Coastal Resiliency, but I'm sure that they uh, are aware of this project as well. Well, let's hope so. What is the cost of this project? Uh, construction costs is around 18 million. Uh huh. So, yeah, I think it, it would be great to get some follow up. I, I will ask it in our committee uh, about the specifics on the sort of utility work and what's going on in terms of the now current plans for Pied IC port and how that will be, you know, acknowledged. Uh, additionally, I'm just curious, uh, does uh, I, I, I can't quite capture it all here tonight, but I'm just curious, is, does this work at all with the, with the work that's being done at 7 Hanover Square and 70 and the intended work at 77 Water vis-a-vis -vis the uh, closing in of those arcade spaces, those pops? Are, is there any uh, aspect of this that you're working with them yes. uh, specifically, I would imagine? Or uh, Yes, we're coordinating with DOT and there being the liaisons between those projects. Um, so they've shared uh, our drawings with with them. So they're looking to incorporate our work um, and or looking to step aside when when we're about to um, uh, work nearby. So we are definitely coordinating with DOT on that. And and do you know what's going on in seventy seven Water Street specifically with your project? Um, I believe so. Um, what we're doing is more of a um, pedestrian bump out into the street. We're not doing the work that's um, raising the grade of the street there. That's the other project there, but um, we are coordinating with them as well. Well, um, I'm not going to take more time here, Pat, but I definitely uh, hope you'll come back. It looks like you haven't been here for three years at the land use meeting. Maybe it's time also we could do that together, but it would be great to get a better handle on how all this will work together with the plans that are afoot on Water Street um, in those pops. Um, okay, thanks very much. Yeah, of course, and, and Alice, um, why, why don't we take a look and see if I can get you a, a quick write up on sort of the, the planting palette, how that considers resiliency as well as the um, permeability, you know, adding new planter space. Yeah, um, the utility plans, yeah, I'm working. So that'd be great. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, and then um, uh, just a uh, point of clarification, I think we were here in, uh, Oh, right, because we were here March 3rd of last year. So um, this is the most recent presentation uh, before this one, which is tonight. Um, yeah, see you on land use in 2018 was the last land use. Meeting. Oh, and land use and land yeah. use. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay, great. Thanks, Alice. All right, so anything else? Any other questions? 
Lucian, do we have anybody? Yeah, no, you we actually have, have um, me. Tammy. Oh, Tammy. Hi. Tammy. Hi, Tammy. Hey, guys. I'm like the quiet lurker. You just never know when I'm here. <laughs> um, um, well, thank you for coming back and thank you for this detailed presentation. Alice touched on some of the points that I was going to mention because when Send in Hanover Square presented to us, it was actually after you had presented and we pointed out with them the differences with the plans that were not overlapping in a, a natural meshing way and there were parts that were drastically different when it came to the streetscape in front of the buildings based on presentations we had already had we asked them to come back to us we haven't seen them so i'm asking you if you would not mind um, the project overview looks great we were supportive of it then um, but what I'd really like to understand and know is what changes, if any, have been made since the last presentation and how, and because I know that either somebody has to change, right? Either the DOT project with you has to change or Seven Hanover had to change. And we never got an update, I'll call it pandemic confusion and I'll, and I'll be nice about that and say, just because it probably slipped away from that point. But we really would like to know what the, what the change is and how it's being handled. Because okay. over by water and over by Hanover, there were massive building changes and street <laughs> changes. Okay, great. So, so Tammy, just to confirm, I understand that. So, uh, you're you're saying that the the most recent versions of plans you've seen from each of those private projects and our project may have some conflicts. So, just to see. Have we coordinated in the meantime and have any changes resulted in, out of that? Correct. And okay. quite frankly, I think I stand a better chance of getting an answer from you um, and coming back to <laughs> us than I do. Thank from you for the that vote of confidence. Hmm. Um, all, as they say. So, yeah, um, we, we, yeah, sorry. I, I just want to just interject that we have uh, discussed with Seven Hanover. It's been some time, but we will reach out to to find out what's going on and get an update. Um, but I, I have it written down on my notes, so I, I will try and get an answer. That would be great. And I mean, we'd obviously be happy to welcome you at the land use meeting where this conversation would belong versus, you know, the construction one. But I definitely um, think that we need to make sure that you know this is this is we're closing the loop on all the things that we're missing if you get what i mean great yeah sounds good we'll follow up on that perfect and then just you know just for protocol when we're talking about plans and stuff um definitely quality of life is the best committee we have who will handle all the construction issues but any changes to the land use plan should come back to land use or should come back to executive where quality of life can opine resiliency can opine and everybody can opine in one meeting so you have two choices and we're happy to accommodate whichever you can make with the most complete information great sounds good awesome well, thank you so much for coming, and I'll go back. Thank you. Hope software. you're doing well. You too. Thanks. Okay, great. Any other questions? I can't see the hand. Lucian, any other hands up? I'm not seeing any other hands. Okay. Uh, My Bob, hand. Up. Bob's hand, but not in the attendee section. Bob. I just want to. I just wanted to list some old concerns that. Uh, used to be mentioned in the community. One is that people were concerned that there was no bike lane included in this. Another problem that we used to discuss was the substantial vehicular congestion already on Water Street that was pre COVID. And then maybe if we ever have post COVID, we'll have serious congestion there again. And then I think there's some accommodations that we have to have for scooters. Delivery bikes, delivery vehicles, uh, and bike parking, city bikes. So those are all uh, all concerns that I've heard uh, expressed before. 
And so since all this is being accomplished by reducing the street, um, then all those street uses have to be accommodated elsewhere, including the idea of the parking. Okay, those are elements, and so. So to it, answer your question about the the bike lane, um, DOT uh, will not put a bike lane on Water Street just due to traffic congestion, and it's it's just not safe to to have a, a bike lane. Um, that and that concern should be taken up with DOT. Um, and we are installing a uh, city bike. Um, there will be city bike uh, stations uh, in this project along the, the area. And I think there's an existing one that we're relocating, right? Right, Steve? Yes, uh, we, we'll probably remove it for temporarily and, and put it back in. How about general bike parking? Um, I believe there is, um, uh, we are installing DOT bike racks, yes. I think one of the problems I just noticed overall is that whether or not there are bike lanes, uh, there are bikes everywhere. And now we actually have bike delivery vehicles uh, that have, you have a, uh, an electric bike and it has a, a little trailer on it, making deliveries from various companies. All of those things, are produce a lot of speed and a lot of congestion. And as an, a senior person on the streets, they're, they're dangerous, but that we need to accommodate where they're going. Uh, and uh, I don't see those. I don't see that in the planning here at all. Uh, Bob, those are really design elements and we're dealing with construction. So I think we need to wait as Tammy said, can you take this up when they come back and address some of the other issues that Tammy was asking them to coordinate with Hanover Square. So uh, when when do we come back with these issues? Which which meeting? I'm not sure yet. I think that yeah, they're yeah, we'll, 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 we'll make a determination. Yeah, yeah and, and I I do, you know, I do want to be clear here that um, you know, although we'll we'd be happy to talk about, you know, any changes um, that were made in in response to coordinating with the with the private projects nearby in the project area. Um, this has been been uh, greenlit by OMB to proceed uh, fully permitted. So we are going to begin construction in uh, April or May. But you know, obviously happy to talk about how decisions were made, um, and if there's you know any flexibility we can have at this point. Okay, so um, obviously um, there's going to be a lot more discussion um, about this. Thank you. I appreciate you coming tonight and presenting to us. And we Thank will you for having us. Well, Thank we you. will be seeing you soon, I suspect. Great. Stay healthy and stay warm, everyone. You also. You also. All right. Good night. Good night. All right. Good night. Okay. Okay. I'm making a, a chair decision to move um, number five, which is uh, a rezo that. Uh, Mariama and Justine have uh, brought to the committee. So take it away, Mariama and Justine. So the CARES Act, and I'm sorry, I'm using the acronym. I, I, I don't recall what it spells out, um, but basically it is a federal uh, vehicle to provide COVID relief to um, others, to um, mortgage forbearance, eviction moratorium, foreclosure moratorium, rent relief, and all of these things. But there seems to be uh, a gap, which uh, co-op also supports condo going through. And so Justine and I co-authored this working draft um, in that regard and are hoping that you guys um, will support it. Lucian, can we bring it up or is that? Everyone should have- Give me one second, I'm gonna bring it up for you. Lucian sent out an email to everyone earlier about the packet of all the information and it's in there, if you can. Um, I, I also put a link in the chat. Um, the link doesn't in, work, Lucian. Oh, and really? I think, yeah, and at least it's not working for me. And I didn't see the email, sorry. And Lucian, the email that you sent before, when I tried to open it up, it, it was like uh, blurred. Yeah. I'm happy to I also quickly read. 
Yeah, let's do that because I can't see it. Yes, okay. I would appreciate that, Mariama, if you don't mind. Okay, well, that's up for me. This is what it looked like if you clicked on the uh, if you clicked in the link. So it's in here. I'm just, I'm just going to read it from your uh, screen. To make it big, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. I think I'm the, the top is chopped off. <laughs> Scroll down a little bit. Thank you. There you okay. Go. So uh, again, regarding COVID-19 relief for residential condominiums and cooperatives, um, cooperatives here to after to be referred to as co-ops, uh, condominiums referred to as condos. The cooperatives or co-ops and condos are multifamily developments with a form of collective ownership structure with an emphasis on tenants having control over their individual domicile through investor or institutionally owned units are not uncommon and whereas Congress passed the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act, that, that's the CARES Act spelled out, um, mm -hmm. which was signed into law on March 27th, 2020 to address some of the economic effects of the COVID-19 pandemic and Section 4022-4022 of the CARES Act provides single family homeowners who are experiencing financial hardship due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the right to forbearance up to 180 days, which can be extended for another 180 days, so a, a full year, from making mortgage payments on loans owned or security, securitized by Federal National Mortgage Association, otherwise known as Fannie Mae, and the Federal Home Loan Mortgage Corporation, also known as Freddie Mac. And the CARES Act provides for rent relief, mortgage forbearance, and moratoriums on evictions and foreclosures, but seemingly could do with an emergency stopgap measure with specific regard to co-op and condo apartment owners. And co-op, condo or co-ops that meet the qualified lending requirements of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are considered warrantable. And thus buyers who wish to purchase an apartment or shares will have access to government-backed lending options, which have preferable terms when compared to unsecured lending products. And the pandemic gutted housing markets in New York City, and the sudden drop in demand deprived the, lenders, the leadership of the various developments from adjusting budget strategies to accommodate for the loss in unit sales, uh, unit sales-based revenues, sorry, and led to subsequent assessment charges on owners and shareholders, many of whom are on fixed incomes and not able to absorb unexpected housing-related charges. And if left unchecked, the pre precipitous drop in unit sales-based revenues could inevitably lead to a debt spiral in which the lack of mortgage availability further dampens demand which leads to a larger sales related income deficit for co-ops and condos, pushing them further out of compliance with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac requirements, which, requ which places additional constraints on mortgages. Now, whereas newer buildings where the sponsor has not had the initial opportunity to sell units to new buyers and still owns a large share of the units do not qualify for warrantability by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, and whereas that in turn has the effect of preventing lenders from offering inexpensive government secured mortgages to any prospective purchasers, which further depresses one's ability to buy or sell a co op or condo apartment. And therefore, be it resolved, CB1 calls on our esteemed elected officials to work on federal, state, and local levels to provide regulatory relief where appropriate, either by relaxing prohibitions or requirements on commercial entities that govern co-ops or condos in terms of budget flexibility or by creating grants or zero interest loans to prevent burdensome assessments. And be it further resolved that CB1 also requests that our congressional delegation pass legislation or urge the Small Business Administration to relax Paycheck Protection Program or PPP resources 
to address financial shortfalls not currently provided for in the CARES Act so that there is a parity between single family homeowners and those who collectively contribute to the success of a multifamily development as or condominium. And be it further resolved, the CB1 calls on officials to prevail upon Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to clarify warrantability requirements to not penalize residential units for sale in buildings that land on said list for reasons that are specifically attributable to the timing of the pandemic and only to serve to deepen the emerging housing crisis in New York City. Yeah, I see that. I saw that typo. I'll fix that. Okay. Okay. So, any Thanks. questions or comments on that? Or, I'm sorry. Did I, did, sorry. Did I see? Um, there was some place that I thought I read earlier, but now I, I I had walked away. Was there something that specified that these co-op or condos had to be uh, solvent? Yes. Okay. Sorry. I thought I saw that earlier. So I. Mariam, I think Bob Schnick has his hand up. Do you have anything, Justine, or say? No, I think this is this. You did a good job with this resolution, and um, okay. I think it expresses what we need to do. I I think it's clear, but of course I'm very close to it, so always open to input from other people. Okay, let's have Bob. Um, Bob, you're muted. Unmute yourself. If, assuming your hand is raised. Um, yeah. As I, I don't, I, I tried to read this and understand it, but I think I'd have to read it and reread it and reread it. So I'm not really sure what's going on here. But have you calculated the kind of money it would take to to fund a program like this, or what? How big is this really? It looks the, the like program. The program exists, okay, and it's it exists for um, what was meant to be all Americans. Right, so if you're an every every residential class of tenant, so if you are a renter, right, if you are subletting, you're therefore a renter as well. Um, if you're a single family dwelling owner, if you are um, just got a mortgage, or right, you're you, you have a mortgage that you have to pay. Is anybody who is not you're in danger of eviction? All of these things are covered. The only thing that's yeah. not covered. Are that these assessments money. that are only attributable to co-ops and condos? So it's sort of like we were left out of the equation. When can I jump in again? To be included. Can I jump in again? Because I had, you know, we've had many conversations about this, and I said the same thing, Bob, in the beginning. I, I'm not an owner, and I didn't understand it. Uh, when, it. when you ask about how much money, do you mean there's no money that that has to be there's I think you need to explain that, Mary. I'm, they're not asking for yeah. money to be contributed. Right. No, that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's true as well. We're not, I mean, the, the CARES Act is something that's funded. So I want to be clear about that. Um, and I, I saw that Hannah was on. I don't want to put her on the spot, but she may wish to jump in at some point and, and clarify the details of the CARES Act. Um, I also included a, a link with the resolution from where I found. Well, um, yeah information to that in that regard. Um, but what we're no. asking for actually is for some of the laws regarding warrantability. Specifically what, does that mean? what does warrantability mean? I asked the same question. Warrantability <laughs> is sort of like um, it's like financial stability, right? That's yeah, it. it's it's well it's I want to say this, but at the same time, um, it's not really because the the co-ops and condos for which we're seeking help are otherwise solvent, but there are there's a test basically that's used as a mechanism to determine who would normally in normal times be eligible uh, for a, a secured loan and who wouldn't. So a person would go for uh, you know into the bank and they'd want a secured loan and they'd not only have to have their credit checked but the credit of the co-op or condominium where they're purchasing would also have to be checked so we're asking for credit um co-ops and condos that have full bank accounts but for accounting reasons are not able to use that money um 
you know, well, they're different buckets, kind of. Can I Ram, if I could jump in, it, they're different yeah. buckets. So, so Colos and condos have have um, operating expenses, and then they have their capital costs. The the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac for a for a a co-op or condo to be warrantable or warranted, whatever the right verb right. is, um, you need to have the money in your um, operating account. Yes. If you could have millions in your in your um, long term reserve fund, that's not going to count right now today under the Freddie Mac Freddie there. Yeah. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac um, blending a situation. Rule under, under the Freddie Mae and, and, and <laughs> Freddie Mac. No, I can't and, say it. You know who it is. Freddie ladies, and Fannie. There's a rule that prevents uh, an entity from transferring those funds. So we're asking if, for example, that rule could be relaxed. Relaxed you can until COVID's over. Not, not forever, but until right. COVID's over. And what, that would, and what that would do would be to give people who've got these condos or co-ops, there it's the ability to be able to sell your place mm -hmm. if you need to, without having to worry about only having cash buyers, for example, because that limits the sales right there, number one. But number two, even when you're there, if in fact the building needs to be uh, get themselves financially liquid enough in their operating accounts, they're gonna have to do assessments on the people that live in the building. So uh, just as an example, does our building, Liberty Court, have this problem or? Our building does not have the, court? at the moment in time, no. Our building does not have the cash flow problem today. Our building, as you know, Bob, because you brought it up in, in meetings before, our building has had problems with, um, uh, what's, I'm going to call it sponsor-owned uh, uh, apartments. We, we right. refer to that in this resolution. Also, I've also myself been confronted with problems with, um, with sea level rise and and yeah, that, owns that, way. that 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 kind of insurance those are the things yes those are the and things that we're asking also, for an I've entity also, that's otherwise solvent for those things to be relaxed temporarily <laughs> so that we're able to sell our apartments if we're interested in doing that so that buyers are not just loans and mortgages but government secured loan mortgages the and so that we have relief time. and support just the same way every other classification of residential tenant does. And that's all this is that's asking the ask. for. It, it shouldn't the be ask. any more money on, out ladies, of anybody's ladies, pocket. Ladies, it shouldn't Justine. be money out of the CARES Act. Justine, hold yeah. on. Bob, do you understand? Uh, no. <laughs> because, <laughs> because, because if I was, if, because if I were a bank, and then I were, were insuring this building. I wanted to. I would have to make sure that if there was a was another Sandy during this period, and this was flooded, that it was insured. Okay. And that's when I. No, no, it's not that. It's not that. I'll say okay. So for example, the CARES Act prevents banks from being able to foreclose on more. A bank does not have that privilege at the moment because the federal government put a stop to that. So anybody that's in a single family home who would otherwise be in danger of foreclosure or is unable to pay their mortgage and could use some sort of amnesty or in this case forbearance, they are getting it under the CARES Act. So we're not asking for the banks or the government to do anything that they're not doing for other Americans. We're simply clarifying that co-ops and condos have seemingly been inadvertently left out. And so we're asking for inclusion that doesn't require any money being laid out. It requires us to be allowed to do business, essentially. Can I, can I just jump in again? Yeah. Um, Bob, do you still understand? It has nothing to do with insurance. And Mariama explained it to me in a very simple <clears throat> way. So you have two accounts. You have two accounts for your condo or condominium. You have an operating expense account, which is like a slush fund. And you have a, I mean, an operating uh, account, which is what you need to run the building on a daily basis. And you have a capital account, which is like a slush fund, right? So if you have big emergencies, you have to replace windows, you have to do whatever. So what's happening is because people are not working and people are not able to sell their uh, <laughs> condos and people are not able to buy condos because they can't get guaranteed Fannie Freddie mortgages. 
So, and because Fannie and Freddie is saying, or the government, the federal government is saying, you can't take the money out of your capital account and put it into your operating account to make up for the difference that you normally would get. So people who are working normally paid X amount of money every month, and all of that went into the operating account, right? Got me? Hey, Pat, Pat? Yes. Can I, can, can you just go back, uh, Lucian, could you just go back to the warrantability, like the, the therefore be resolved? Because I think by, by, by using a, a synonym for the warrantability, see if I'm on the right track. Uh, Truthfully, if we have to do this much explaining. No, no, no. But there's one, one thing we had a, okay, condos or co-ops that meet the qualified lending requirements of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are considered eligible. Is, is that that's that's basically what you're asking for, right? You just want the same rights as as the other uh, uh, tenants, correct? Yes. So so if you just if, like I said, I don't need to change that word, but I'm just saying it in our minds. If people just say are considered uh, uh, condos, condos and co-ops that meet these requirements, are of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are considered eligible, and thus buyers, and that. To me, that's you know. I don't think that's. I don't think that's what the issue is. I, I don't think that. Well, that's some people. I thought that there, that some Let some people have said that. Michael, you know, that it is the issue, Mariam. Okay, actually, well, ladies, ladies, because ladies, basically, ladies, it, ladies, it, ladies, it. Hold on, Michael. Michael, you there? That's exactly what they they are saying. Hold on a second, Michael. <laughs> you mean Kettering? Where is he? Who Who are you looking for? Michael Kettering. Michael Kettering. I don't see Michael. Yeah, I see him there. Yes, unmute. Yeah. Oh, I do see him. Yes, he's yeah. muted. Michael, unmute. Yeah, Pat, Pat, okay. Sorry, I Thank was you. muted. Yes. Thank you. Do you understand this? You're a lawyer. So is Justine. But are you, t do you understand this, this Rezo? Yeah, I, I think I'm comfortable with it. Can I explain it? No. <laughs> See, that's the problem. If we can't explain it, Miriam and Justine. Okay. Can I go to other questions and maybe they'll maybe we'll get clarity that way? But doesn't the word eligible make things a little clearer? It does. So I my question is that it is the problem that you started out doing this resolution because renters are are being there's a special no, no, nothing to do with renters whatsoever this is all Rent, about renters are covered Rent, renters get rent relief if they need under the cares act renters are covered let, okay, me, wait, Mariam, let, let me say this back to you bob but part, part part what problem. i'm trying to say before you answer it okay go ahead what i'm trying to say is that renters are put are protected from evictions and have other privileges or other advantages and that it it seems to me like you maybe set off to write this so the condo and condominium owners would have some advantages too. Is that that's not right? advantages? Yes. Not advantages. Protections. protections. The same but way every other. It's not only renters. It's homeowners as well. American homeowners have uh, zero interest mortgage rates for those who are able to pay something, and more complete mortgage forbearance for those who are not able to pay. And oh. foreclosure protection. They cannot be foreclosed on. It is illegal right now for a bank to foreclose on a the CARES Act. Right. So we're asking those... co-ops and condos to be included in those protections, the same way the homeowners are, the same way the renters are. It's but, but we'll take okay, it one on, step farther, Mariama. Because... Hold on a second. Hold on. <sighs> Elizabeth, are you there? Elizabeth. Unmute there? yourself. Unmute yourself. I don't see any Elizabeth with a hand raised. I don't see no no hand up. I'm trying to get some people. To but see. there are people with hands up that may help to De bring some clarity. Deanna has her hand oh. up right now. Then go to some people with the hands up and let's see if they can explain it. Like I'm go to Detta. Go to Detta and and yeah. <coughs> Detta, unmute yourself. Yeah, unmute Detta. I am here. Yeah. So I do work in this field. So I have a couple of concerns. One con one issue is that co-ops and condos are completely different legal entities. A co-op, you own shares in a corporation that are allocated to your apartment. A condo, you own real property. A co-op can borrow against the co-op. And so the co-op can have a mortgage overall. And 
they can do that to, to for some of their capital costs so that they don't have to have an assessment. A condo cannot borrow against the condo because the condo is just a shell. So the condo would have to have assessments if they had a capital cost come up that they hadn't planned for and didn't have reserves. So I'm I'm trying to understand, are you wanting the co-op that has a mortgage against the co-op as a whole to be able to have the protections on it? Or, no. or no. Like, Okay. No, 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 no okay. there's no mortgage involved. There's no mortgage yeah. involved. Okay. Basically, so, so, so Data, we're not, uh, can I speak and answer Data's question? Okay. So, so, so yes, they're two separate entities. The issue that we're trying to address, because it's, it's complicated. I think part of the reason why condos and co-ops were left out of this is because this issue about the warrantability and the qualified lending requirements in this way, the eligibility requirement would only apply to a condo, condo or co-op. Um, are you talking you know about that, condo? okay? Many people on the call who are not condo or co-op owners don't know that. So step one is we're, we, maybe we're just too complicated for, for a lot of people. Are you talking about co-op? Are you talking, talking about, about both? Um, I mean, I know there are some co-ops where it, the co-op as a whole is not able to pay their utilities, not able to pay their taxes and then banks will not give mortgages to people who want to buy those units because we're not talking about that we're being very specific in that well, we're trying only to understand. talking about co-ops and condos that are otherwise solvent and that have um funds and reserves but don't be i'm um, yeah i'm just we're not, not talking about anybody in trouble question because because when, yeah, I'm trying to understand what it is because I do work in this field, so I understand it pretty clearly. So if I'm struggling to understand this resolution and I work in this field, I think there is some confusion here. Okay. Yeah, because the individual mortgage holder for a co-op or condo would have the same protection. So I'm trying to understand what. So, so it's not the protection for the individual. It, it's, it, it's a protection for the actual building as okay, a whole. Just so you mean everybody, a co -op who everybody, has a time out. Against Data, the co -op. That's time no. out. Time out. Time out. Okay. First of all, it is twenty to nine, and there's I'm still two major that. topics. So, my feeling is that if people who and lawyers who are reading complicated briefs all day are not understanding this, then it needs to be simplified. I think it's still a good reso that you know the, what you're trying to achieve. But obviously, uh, Lucian, where are you? I think this needs to be simplified, ladies. I, I just don't think that. I, mean, I understand. Asking... Just, if I could say this, Pat, I think we need to spend more time on co-op. Not tonight. Right. I get what you're saying to move on. Right. I think we need to spend more time on co-ops and condos so that people on the boards at, and get the input of Detta, for example, and, and right. uh, Michael and other people as well. Exactly. Um, who've got a I lot of knowledge. But I think the regular lay person who is not, if the lawyers aren't understanding it, and you know how long it took to explain it to me. But the law before the of Congressman Nadler has her hand up. I'd like to hear her. Maybe we, let's it's hear Hannah took time what we're... to visit us, so let's hear from Hannah. Yeah, so um, I thank you um, for looping me in on this. Um, there's so clearly there's some conversation that you know if you guys want to go back and talk about it i will say that if there's any specific questions we can get answered so um mariam actually reached out to me about this and so i've reached out to freddie mack about some of these questions to see what programs are available we're waiting to hear back from them um so i will come back to the committee and happily report about what uh, programs are available i also want to flag that in the America Rescue Plan that is proposed, um, that's the Biden 1.9 billion uh, trillion uh, COVID relief plan. There are additional um, monies designated for uh, homeowners, which I don't know would include, you know, co-op or condo owners. And I can get more information as the text of the bill gets released. And I can also like circle back with our legislative team to see what information that they have. I don't know if that's going to impact this plan. Uh, this. Uh, Renzo specifically, but I do, I will get that information. I don't know if that's going to help because, you know, the CARES Act is passed, but this hopeful, you know, hopefully in the next, I mean, I, I, they've been talking about having the bill be um, introduced either late, later in the month or in March. So there might be some more clarity about that program or additional um, assistant oppor assistance opportunities or funding or, you know, 
for the homeowners as as you are in a, in a corporate condo it, hopefully it includes it but once i get that language i'm happy to send that over i don't know if that you know changes your timeline of when you would want to introduce the resolution but i'm happy to um report back a with a um summation of that part of the plan but b if there's any specific questions that you have that would help you write the resolution more clearly feel free to email them to me and i'll circle back with our team and get you an answer thanks hannah i mean yeah. I, I think mariama and Justy, like i said i think it's a good you know idea and this is something you should pursue but i think if we lay people are not understanding it clearly yeah have that. I, I think I think even with that, it wasn't like the, the CARES Act is passed already. The reason that we are still looking to um, be included in that is because we're not seeking funds. I want to I want to be very clear about that. Right. This is not about money. This is not about asking to for any cut of the 1.9 billion yeah, have, or have, of the past have. funds. This is the fact. This is about the fact that the federal government, in passing the CARES Act, Put Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae in charge of this component of the bill, the the um, housing regulation. They already, of course, you know, ha were involved in this part of it, but they but they specifically put them in charge of these vehicles, of the mortgage forbearance, of the rent relief. That is controlled by them. So we're asking for the for those rules to be um, expanded or in some cases relaxed. So that we could work, we could navigate them as co-op and condo owners. Because what's happening is people are unable to get secured loans without them. And if they can't get secured loans, they can't buy our apartments. And we can't sell and we can't flee the city or, or move to another place like everybody else can. So our options are limited only. We're, not that of renters, not that of single family homeowners, only co-op and condo owners. Our options are limited. Well, basically you're saying your options are limited because you cannot sell your apartment and you cannot, and other people don't want to buy your apartments because they can't get secured. In the cases that people want to buy our apartments, they cannot through a secured loan. They'd have to get an unsecured loan. An unsecured okay. loan, higher interest rates, whatever. Right. You just okay, want so to include in the CARES Act. That's all, right? That's all we're asking to be done. I mean, it's, it's like basically, I, I don't know. It's 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 not complicated. It's mumbo jumbo. It's just so simple. They just want to be included in the CARES Act. Okay, Mitch. Right, uh, right. I I, I, I hear that. So let me let me hear what Freddie Mac has to say um, when they reach back out to me, and I'll make sure to update everybody. Okay, great. Thanks, Anna. Um, ladies, I think that you can bring it back to the committee next month. I think that you should work on it and simplify it and put it into regular speak because it took you a long time to explain it to me. And that was verbally talking to me about yeah. it. So I get a, ha I understand it and I could explain it to everybody, but they should be able to read it and understand and be able to get it right away. And if Michael's not getting it and, you know, uh, I, I don't know, you know, there are a lot of people on the committee. It's not just Michael. Michael is a lawyer and he reads all these complicated things. So do you just see, but you understand because you wrote it, you know? Well, part of the problem here is, Pat, is that we just got this thing. I can't even see the whole resolution at once. The link doesn't work. And and it's just a little too, a little too, complicated. A little too fast. I, I, I would love the time to spend a little time Okay. familiarizing so that, myself with the issue. I think that, <laughs> Maybe we could email that, it, Lucian, so that, yeah. okay, just the actual document, make right. it a PDF so nobody can change it, whatever, write it up, but this way the people have a chance to look at it before the next meeting, because I couldn't so open it up. Also, then that way we can't talk about it offline, but people can write Read their it. questions or yeah. make their suggestions or do their edits separately and send it in, and then we can approach it again. And by that time, Hannah will hopefully have come back with some information and maybe you know it, it just i think it would be an easier process for next well month. maybe we can bring it to the full board first on tuesday if people understand it by then and then if they don't then we revisit, revisit next month well you can't bring it to the full board though unless the committee has already talked about it discussed it and voted on it i mean it what would new, be it could be new business at the full board if people Tammy, understand, read it by then and understand it Tammy, no? Lucian. Tammy, are you there? 
Tammy, Tammy. Lucian, are you there? I'm here. All right. So I don't. I don't think. Is that is that correct or wrong? I'm, I could be wrong. I mean that I mean, that that that's up to the chair. I can't speak to. Oh, that's up to the chair. Okay. Tammy, but I'm not hearing Tammy. Unmute yourself. I see Tammy, but I don't. Oh, she's All muted. Right, I'm not sure. There on. she is. Sorry. There she is. There she is. Sorry. Um, eating dinner with a dead phone. So I thought I thought you might be right, eating. So I. I, I I appreciate the hard work that's gone into this so far. I think that it does deserve the for the work to be complete in committee. It's really important. So if Hannah has a representative from Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac who can not only opine but come to the next meeting to work through with the committee so everyone knows exactly what it is. And if the ask is as simple as we want condos and co-ops to be included, then perhaps a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac person could help us work through what's missing How to from the yeah. act to enable that. Right. All that work needs to be done in committee. So when Pat or Mary Amar or whomever it is is standing up there, it's simple to explain. I've sat here listening for a long time. Many very smart people on this line don't seem to have all of the same understanding. So I think we just need more data to move it forward. I think it's important. And I think if Hannah can help us secure somebody from Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, who can speak to this, that would be fantastic. Yeah, I think so. I think, I think it just has to be made simpler. Like, you know, the old adage kiss, you know, keep it simple, mm -hmm. stupid got to be direct enough that people don't have to ask. And the same thing happened in the workshop when we did the Rezo workshop. It's got to be direct <laughs> enough that people don't ask a whole bunch of questions, that they actually understand it upon first reading, you know, or at least second reading. So I think Michael's right. I think um, if we can just delay it till next month, it, I think you'd be much happier because you wouldn't be spending half an hour having to explain it to people. Okay. Yeah, there was a there was a link in the Reza with with some I think would could get, be useful to us all. I think explaining the issue a little bit more, but we couldn't really access it. So I think okay. we just need a little more time. Okay, so we, we'll we'll get it out to everybody. Thanks, as we Michael. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Dada, Michael. Everybody, yeah, Mitch, everybody, and and Bob for for piping in and and asking the questions and helping us try to clarify this. Appreciate. Yeah, thank you, and Hannah, of course. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so it's it's ten nine. Um, I'm kind of hesitant because let's see. Well, there's one big thing I think we should talk about is the hotel versions in Lower Manhattan, and I don't know if if you had trouble seeing the link, you may not have gotten this information. Um, and so did every did anyone get to see this what Governor Cuomo is proposing about converting hotels to residential, which is something we had discussed a couple of months ago, Mary on the Yeah. No, I never saw the email at all with okay. any of the links. Yes, uh, I sent you kind of last minute the, the resolution, the piece a December or January meeting, we had a housing um, resolution that we directed toward the state representatives. Um, trying to push their bills forward, a couple of different proposals by Eulene and by uh, Brian Kavanaugh. And at the bottom of that rezo, the last, therefore, be it resolved or whereas, uh, referred to the fact that Rebney is now interested in conversions as well. And so we were seeking to include that. And Tammy thought that that item belonged on its own um, resolution, made a friendly amendment to that effect. But then I think. The next meeting was too packed, and then the next month we didn't have a meeting. And so, coincidentally, uh, we're on that conversion topic again because now the, the governor has joined the conversation. So, we do have, and I sent it sort of last minute to you, Justine. I gave you access to the Google Doc again. Uh, I don't know if you saw, and Lucian as well, for that one piece. Just, that um, one just, that email I saw, but I, it doesn't open. I can't get into it. All right, okay, let me jump ladies, in. Can I jump in for a quick sec? Okay, go ahead. Tim. This topic came up. This topic came up at Borough Board this morning. So fresh off the presses, um, I shared with Lucian. I 
think I shared with Pat the yeah. resolution that CB5 has done. Um, and they called me right after the borough board meeting because I piped up and said, Governor's proposal, of course, sucks because it doesn't include community board one in any way. You know, he, well, in any significant way, considering that his demarcation line of Manhattan was everything north of Chambers. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, they, we, in discussing last night, we figured out because we kept saying that there was an SRO. It was the hotel that was on the corner of Chambers and West Broadway. And so obviously they knew that also. So they made the demarcation line in the middle of Chambers Street that, that hotel fell into. It. But, you know, it's ridiculous because the number of hotels that we have that have closed for the most part are south of Chambers. Right. The class B and C office buildings are for the most part south of Chambers. So there is that aspect. But the people from CB8 and CB5 reached out to me um, after the meeting and some of the land use people, and I shared it with Pat and Lucian, because there's a very dangerous precedent that I think Justine um, and I and anybody in Battery Park City know exceedingly well. And that has to do with the fact that the way the governor's proposal currently is listed, that the developers, anybody, any conversion has the right to pay into a fund to instead of adding the affordable housing. And that fund will be used somewhere by somehow in some other area. Yeah, bad, bad, bad plan. Right. So, I mean, for those of us who live in Battery Park City, you know, all the revenue that was supposed to go out and go to build affordable housing, except the fact Next that day. once it leaves, the mayor can choose what he wants to do with it. So it doesn't actually go to affordable housing yep. and it's not allowed to be in the neighborhood. Those are all the kinds of things that we don't want. We want affordable housing in our neighborhood. neighborhood I mean, right. It's just, and I don't, I think we can all agree that Five World Trade Center is a start, not a finish. It's some of what we asked for. I mean, we I think we had asked for much more, but we stand an opportunity to really be very careful and thoughtful on this and put some notes in. So I would ask that Pat or Lucian be able to share with you the resolution that CB5 did because graciously they've already done some of the research, their land use people, and sent it to us. Um, so Lucy, that, is it possible for you time. to send this out to everybody? And and what is this that we're looking at right now? Hold on a second, Justine. What what are you looking at? The what Lucian has on this the article that's that's summarizing yeah. what that's the governor is. Go back to this article. Yeah. So, so this Lucian, article is something that I included in the link that some of you said works, some of you said doesn't work. It but doesn't work. I can't okay, get it. Just, some of you. Let me it do works it. for some of you. It doesn't work for. Okay. First so, of all, can yeah. you send that CB fives reso to everybody? And so, the the article that was set that you're looking at on the screen, and I don't know if everybody can read, but the governor is basically proposing that um, I think it's from Chamber Street up to 110th. I think it is that. Any, yeah, Chambers to 110th Street, that any class B or class C buildings, and I looked up what the, those are, uh, that are, you know, empty and not being used, could be converted to residential use. And if you're interested in what a class B building is, class B buildings are generally a little older, but still have good quality management and tenants. These are older buildings and are located in less desirable areas and often in need of extensive renovation. And class C buildings are even older and you know they're the lowest classification of office buildings and space is class C. These are older buildings and are located in less desirable areas and often in need of extensive renovation. Architecturally, these buildings are the least desirable and building infrastructure and technology is outdated. So we have buildings, we have hotels that are empty in our community. I don't know if they'd be considered class B or C because some of them are, you know, kind of new and main and it's a desirable area. So they don't seem to fall into class B or C if we're talking about less desirable areas, but they're empty that are not being used. And maybe um we could yeah, well what we want to do is understand and ask why we're not included. We right. want to know why Lower Manhattan is not included in this proposal. 
And I guess that means writing a rezo actually asking why we're not included. Now, I don't care means, why, Pat. I just want to be included. I don't care yeah, why. Yeah, right. I mean, it's not really asking why. And, and, and I guess my question, though, um, Tammy, is we want to be included, but we want to be included in a way that makes sense, right? And I can't follow. This is all happening too fast. Basically, you said two things. Number one, we're not included, but number two, Tammy, you said something about the governor's plan is like basically Battery Park City. I want to be included, but I don't want to be included in the Battery Park City plan. I want it to be. So, I can, well, I can try to, to summarize a little bit it. if it's okay. Um, there's a couple portions to this that I think are um, of note. And maybe this addresses that the, 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 the part that's applicable from 110th Street to Chamber Street are the Class B residential buildings that are built, I think, purpose built as residential, but have been operating as hotels for quite some time. That um, the governor's proposal would allow uh, a very uh, a rapid uh, bureaucratic, uh, a, a very minimal bu bureaucratic threshold for those buildings to convert from hotel use back to residential use, um, provided that 20% of the units are affordable. Now, um, I so sounds like the the closer read of that uh, of the provision says that there's an optional fund that they could pay the equivalent value into, uh, essentially creating an offsite provision. Um, that those of you who who remember um, the the conversations around inclusionary housing and mandatory inclusionary housing, those are the kind of the weakest elements to that um, uh, the offsite provision. So. Um, that's one snag that the committee needs to discuss. The second snag is that um, this is a really specific building type that from we racked our brains in an earlier call to try to figure out why um, it, it stopped at Chamber Street. And it sounds like there is one of those buildings on the north side of Chamber Street just falling within the, the zone of applicability. Um, but it's not really a, a, a common building type in our district, um, what we have more of are purpose built hotels that are are, are, are are very vacant right now. Um, so the other, so the second snag is that you know the 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 narrowness of the of the type of hotel that can be converted doesn't really cover us, um, even if it were expanded to the entirety of our of our district. But we would also need to broaden the types of hotels that can be converted. Two residential units as well, so I think that those are the things that I, by my read, are the the things that require the most uh, uh, comment. Um, huh. Yeah, I have a couple of more things. So number one, twenty percent affordable is not enough, and number two, owner can buy their way out of affordability. I agree with you. That's not that, that that's a no go. But I also think we should push back and say that. I mean, again, this is what I think. But I think 20% affordability in the building is not enough. They need to do it multi tiered building where you've got 20% truly affordable, 20% middle class, 20% upper middle class, 20% rich. And if that can't make people, whoever buys it, that, that's what it is. And it has to go on in perpetuity as far as for the future. None of this nonsense where in 20 years it expires or 30 years it expires, like the 421A and 421G. We really need to, this is a time when we need to put our feet down and say, no, all throughout Manhattan, this is just not acceptable. This is what has destroyed the lack of foresight and the lack of being firm in the past 20, 30 years ago is what led us, is leading us to the crisis that's now. Right. I'm just going to differently. You know, agree with you, but it's nine o'clock now and we need to make some decisions about but what, that's what I'm saying is I, will, I I want us to put this stuff in there. I'm giving you information that I want to put in there. I no, think no, what, said what we you, have to go more. No, no. What are you proposing that we write a rezo now? Um, if we could, what's the time frame on this? Number one. Well, I don't. Let's see. I guess that might be more Tammy. Is this urgent? Can it wait till next month? I mean, this is it's part of the budget um, yeah. negotiations for the state, and so I. When does that I'm, end? Yeah, I'm. I'm. Sadly, I'm, I'm, I couldn't tell you. I don't know typically when they, they, they finish up on that. Is Hannah still on? She might know just because she's. Are we, able, are we able to vote on it if we 
all agree that we want to wrap the red zone, or is that wrong? Or that we're all, we have the same sentiment that we're bothered by having been it's left a, out, to say the least? Because yes, of course. What we're so, the I, could, on. I could definitely take notes on that and, and, and craft a resolution based on some bullet points that you come together as a co committee on. Does do the rest of the does the rest of the committee have enough information about what we're talking about? Can I hear from some people? Besides the big mouths. <laughs> Who else is here? Let's see. Just just jump in. Betty, you have anything to say? I'm not prepared to vote on it. All right. Bob? What would, what would give what would make you prepared to vote on it, Betty? I, I need to read all this stuff, really. I'm you not ready. a lot clearer. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with you, Betty, because I don't even know what I'm saying yet. I, I want to know what community board seven is it seven? Okay. You know what? I here, 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 everybody. First of all, I, I propose I, I from now on, I think that uh, Mariama and I have to try to get the if there's information that we want to write a result, we need to get it out a week before so everybody gets a chance to read it and digest it. I um, we don't know what the deadline is. Tammy, you want to jump in here on something? I'm because I'm proposing that everybody read this, and that um, we come up solution. Mariama and I work on a. When you say we don't have enough information, does that mean we don't know yet whether or not we're opposed? Because I well, think if I, we have, if like, we can get consensus that we're I don't um, think opposed, and and to what? We, I mean, we I, can still be in time for Tuesday, no? I'm not speaking. So I'm here's speaking. an easy way that you can do it. The easiest way that we can do this is to say, because of the way it's formatted right now, is that we do not support Article 7, right? right. Which is the repurposing of underutilized spaces. And we can say, because it doesn't include us south of Chambers, it doesn't provide enough, it doesn't confirm long term. We can do, and that's the simplest, quickest, cleanest way without getting into the dirt. We already know that he announced it doesn't help us south of Chambers. So that we can come be, back to it and do a more in depth. I mean, yes, if right. we could do it more in depth next month and then we could say, I would agree with that, Tammy. That makes sense. We oppose Article right. 7. We, is that we go forward and we say we oppose this part of the budget as it's currently written. Yes. Because they've, they've screwed us anyway on that. And then next month we can take the time and due diligence to craft, craft a resolution of how we do want it. Right. And that gives you the opportunity to speak on both ends. The, the only thing so I want to say we're opposed is that, I'm sorry, when we say we're opposed now, Tammy, is that like in a letter or is that in the resolution as well? It's a resolution. It's yeah. a resolution that goes to the governor because well, it's the about the budget. This is worked out before March. Mm -hmm. You're still, you're still saying that there's an affordable housing crisis that hotel conversions could be part of the answer to. But and not as written. Still can be something that the state legislators work on, that the city works on. You know, no matter what, it's still it's always going to be timely, even if the the budget fight. It's probably going to get pulled out. Uh, uh, but you know, because many of these types of things do. But even if it, even if you miss the deadline, you know, I'm using air quotes with my hands right now. Um, mm -hmm. Even if you miss the deadline, it's still a timely marker to put down because you do, you know, it, it doesn't serve us at all as written, but we do want legislation that can serve us in the future. So, you know, right. as long I, as I, agree, I say we do something, then I call the okay. question. Yeah, yeah I call the questions as long as we say that that we're. Uh, Okay, ladies, we got I, I want to hear back. what the rest of the is, the is the rest of the committee in agreement. Do you understand what we're proposing and are you in agreement? So I think we just have a vote because we have to vote on the reso. So I think we should have a vote that you're that you're okay going forward and that you vote yes on the reso. Does that make sense? Vote yes to say no, basically vote yes that we oppose Article 7. As yeah. proposed, we're, we're, we're voting that we agree with Tammy just just said, right? Yeah, which is opposing Article Seven. Yeah, and then this I can flush out something tomorrow. But I think that 
if you write a, a, a simple, straightforward, we're opposed to it as written or as proposed, and that we um, that we included. want to be included. We want to be included. Lower Manhattan should be included, and that we want. I mean, I don't know, Tammy. That you know, he's talking about these C and B buildings, and I don't know if we should. If we should get into that because I don't understand it. Because yeah, I, I don't I, know. It's the way I heard what she was proposing. It's just a would, classification of office buildings. That's all it is. And we talk so about this not, next month, right? Yes. That's what we're yeah, saying. Basically, what we're what we're doing is we're calling it out. We're saying it doesn't include us. We don't want. Yeah. We don't support it because it doesn't include us. Yes. And and the only other you know relevant facts that we can put in there is you know south of Chamber Street, number of hotels and occupancy, which is all normal stuff that yes. that's based and right. related to his uh, okay. obnoxious ignoring of CB one. Right. Yes. Okay. So let's have oh, a no question. Yeah, I'll second it then. Okay, no, let's have a vote on it. Do we need to have a road yeah. roll call or can we just do it? Anyone opposed to it? Would you please let us know? Yeah, let me let me just make sure I, I have everything pulled up here. Um I need, I'd also like to just take a quick look around the room here just to make sure that we are still um having quorum. Because it's been a long meeting. So they I have in quorum. Uh, just a quick look here. It appears that we do have quorum, especially since Tammy's here. Uh, but I, I just like to just there is a hand up in the in the attendee section. I think it'd be important to. Okay. Yeah, I'm just gonna open this. Catherine Manfred Donia Corgan. Yep. I have a question. I, I mean, so has anyone done the, the the slightest bit of research into what happens after the pandemic? when we need ho hotels for tourists? Has anyone even looked into what you would do to have schools? Everything I hear that there's not even enough schools to take care of the people who are here already. What happens, has anyone looked into any of this? If you bring in hundreds of more people and into empty commercial spaces, where are they going to school? What the infrastructure is? Has anyone looked into in that in the slightest bit? I gotta say no, but I think yeah. Right now, we do know that we have a lot of empty buildings, and we do know that there are going to be a lot of people losing their housing. Well, we know there's an uptick in homelessness already, and so what we're proposing are small, you know, rooms, affordable, small apartments that people can have. And I'm sure not every hotel is going to be converted. And yes, you're right. We need to talk about infrastructure. We talk about that a lot, that we need infrastructure. We need school seats. We need hospitals. We need grocery stores. But I think right now, this is what's, we don't know, you know, what's going to happen after the pandemic. And this is the topic at hand. So while we can, I think we should jump on at least trying to get some housing and afford yeah, it. I think the proposal speaks to vacancies also. It's not saying the governor's planning on going into an operational hotel and kicking yeah. out the guests and, and changing it into an apartment building. These are buildings that are sitting vacant in New York City that need to be abandoned. Built and there are people who need places to live. So it makes sense. It's a win-win. But and this way that it's written is, is inappropriate um, for us because it's exclusive. Catherine wanted to say and something. What, what they're talking about is there's um, his legislation tinkers with the overrides right, that there's limitations on overrides and things like that. There are several hotels who have gone out of business and that are looking to be sold. And there are many not-for-profits who are available to buy them. Um, and as far as school seats, right now that my concern is uh, the city taking away money from the schools due to budget, right? because kids have left. So, yeah, yeah. we actually need more people That's back down here again because instead of being overcrowded, we're, we're under, and we need yeah. more under housing for people to come back down here. Yeah. So, I think we'll have, to a certain extent, we'll have to deal with after the pandemic, after the pandemic, because we don't know. Uh, I think um, my hand was up to this, and I just want to make a kind of comment. And the comment I want to make is that this is a time for. One of the things we can ask for is some kind of fact finding. So we quantify what 
there has to be someone who's thinking about evictions and how many people are going to be evicted. There has to be someone thinking about what are the affordable housing needs that we're going to we're expecting in Lower Manhattan. So it would be good that to ask to have that quantified somewhere or another, so that we even if they're estimates, we're at least thinking about how many people there are and what their needs really are. And what, how many people, how much we want to grow this and how fast, because I think there's a, I think that, you know, this has been a very comfortable community, but now it's a community that's in tremendous transition. And I think how the economics work, we were the financial center of the world. I think that's changing now. And I think how residential people move in here and how they're going to be employed is really a question. So I think there's lots of lots of things to think about. So at least somewhere we have to ask that we think about the future and quantify what that looks like a little bit. Yeah, and part of it is that the people who they're going to be people who uh, are you guys are getting off. You guys are getting off track, though. You have to decide right. whether you're going to do a reso or not. Well, I called the question and it was second by Justine. Right, so, so I'm now we're to hear if there are any opposed. Here we go. Uh, I believe we have quorum, so let's uh, hear if anyone here is opposed. Hearing none. Uh, any, oh, sorry. Go. Okay. Anyone opposed? Okay. Betty? I'm opposed because this is way too rushed and not thought out, and I'm just, yeah, not, not there. Okay. Anyone abstaining? Anyone recused? Hearing none, the motion carries. Okay. So, Lucian, you and I. Uh, and Lucian, I shared. I don't know if you want to, if you want to share it, but I shared that piece of the resolution that we were to add to our January meeting, also with regard to conversions. Um, I put it. I made it open to anyone that has the link, and I shared it in the chat. So, if you wish to share it with everybody, you can, um, if we want to be done that or, or not. I don't know if you want to call on them, though, but there's okay. someone in the, in the everybody, attendee who's- It's who's, quarter who's, after nine. So, Lucian, you and I, and Mariama, can we sit down and work on some wording for this reso tomorrow, please? And I think that we should hold over, Let's see. Our last item on the agenda was this justice justice consideration for the mayor 2021. Um, I think this is something we could hold over to next month. The civilian complaint review board and uh, I wanted to talk about 311 tying in to Comstat, two year mandate to identify areas of structural racism. All right. I think, don't you think um, we can hold this over to next month? Because it's too late to to talk about tonight. Yeah, Pat, tomorrow I'm going to send an email with a lot of files to send around, um, and I will um, include that um, summary with along with everything else in preparation for March. Okay, so I hope everybody can open it tomorrow, and let's just let's um, let's you and Miriam and I get on the phone when it's convenient for you and and draft this reso. Okay. All right. That's it. Anybody have anything else they want to add? Nope. Then I'm going to close the meeting. Okay. Thank, right. you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night.